Okay, Mayor Candell, it's 7 p.m. and you are live on YouTube. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the special city council meeting tonight um, on May 17th at seven o'clock. Um, first, I'd like to do a roll call and I want to just say that all council members are present. And next we'll go on to adopt the agenda. We have a motion to adopt the agenda. I move we adopt the agenda. A second. Great, thank you. Uh, roll call vote. Uh, Vice Mayor Gerringer? Aye. Council Member Burks? Aye. Council Member Anduri? Aye. And Council Member Dawson? Aye. And I'm an aye, so it is unanimous. We'll adopt the agenda. All right, so right now is time for public comments for items not on the agenda tonight. So if you have a public comment for items not on the agenda, please raise your hand and Jeff will bring you in. Okay, and I'll just remind folks, if you're on a telephone, use star nine. And uh, or if you're on a computer or, or an iPad or something, just use the raise hand function. So we have one hand raised and that's Marianne and she is joining the meeting now. Okay, Marianne, you're in, so go ahead and unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Yes. Great. Uh, my name is Marianne Wilton. Uh, I live on Woodland Way in Lafayette, uh, which is a street with a cul-de-sac on both ends. The closest fire hydrant is more than 500 feet away on Dyer Avenue, just below Mount Diablo Boulevard. My question is, since this is a fire safety meeting, um, does the city have any plan uh, to install any fire hydrants in areas like my neighborhood? Uh, if not, can you tell me where I can uh, find out what to do about it? Great, thank you. Um, this is, is typically not a Q&A, but um, please email out and we will get back to you and try to answer your question. Thank you very much. Any I questions for the speaker? I did yes. email. I, I Thank you. And we will now, it's on the public record and we will we'll get an answer for you. Thank you. Great. Oh, great. Thanks. All right. All right, Mayor Kandel, no more hands are raised at this time. All right, so now we're gonna go on to our presentations. Um, this special council meeting um, has been called because as all of you probably heard, this 2021 wildfire season is turning out to be likely even worse than our recent record-breaking wildfire seasons. We as council recently voted on our top priorities for 2021 and we voted unanimously to place the item titled wildfire prevention and utility safety, including firewise in collaboration with the county as our number one priority for our city this year. This meeting is a kickoff to help us understand from our experts what we face and how they are planning to help us face it. I know that we in Lafayette are finally this year starting to create more fire hardened houses and communities. And the Contra Costa Fire Department is helping by increasing staffing and by hiring an officer who's now training we residents in how to create firewise neighborhoods, which are fire hardened neighborhoods. I personally am going through this right now with all of my neighbors after being trained by fire inspector Taylor King. And I can't tell you how much we all learn and how much effort we are all doing now to really protect both our own homes, but actually all of our neighbors' homes as well. I can honestly say that I'm feeling so much better now after doing the right kind of work to protect our neighborhood. So it's our goal as a city to create as many of these firewise neighborhoods as possible in anticipation of this upcoming fire season. It's never too late to start and we'll learn more about it during this meeting, but I just wanna encourage all of you to participate. And it's as easy, you just email to Taylor King at info at cccfpd.org or literally Google Contra Costa Firewise and it'll lead you directly to the Contra Costa Fire, um, Firewise site and the website will be there to help you. So enough for that. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to hand this, hand this meeting off to our police chief, Ben Aldrich to present for the rest of the evening. Uh, good evening council and thank you, mayor. 
Uh, tonight, we're going to have a series of presentations. Uh, we're going to go through each presentation back to back, if you will. Uh, I will be the last presenter. And from there, we'll turn that back to the council for questions and comments to any of the presenters for tonight. Uh, tonight, you will have a presentation by the Contra Costa County Fire Protection District. Uh, that presentation will be headed off by Deputy Chief McAllister, along with Chief Bachman, the Fire Marshal, and Chief Jeff Peters. We'll then be turning it over to the Lafayette Preparedness Commission and La Miranda Cert, and that'll be Duncan Siebert, who chairs both of those, and uh, along with uh, Dennis Rain from MFD, who serves uh, in an assistant role in both of those um, uh, commissions or uh, entities. Uh, then we'll be moving on to PG&E, and Les Putman and team will be making a presentation tonight, followed up by East Bay Mud talking about their um, fuel mitigation and preparations for the upcoming PSPS season. And then myself and John Cornell from Lafayette PD will be doing a presentation on what your police department is doing uh, to be better prepared as we go into this coming season. The goal tonight is for each entity to explain their role within emergency preparedness and fire response, uh, talk about how we work together uh, and discuss uh, not only what we've been doing in 2021, but I think more importantly, all the agencies represented tonight have been working to be better prepared over the last couple of years. And I think you'll hear some of those updates tonight that you may have heard before, but I think are valuable to bring into this entire conversation, not just what we're doing this year, but what we've done in 2020 and 2019, understanding the landscape has changed. Uh, as we know, the fire we experienced here in Lafayette in 2019, along with uh, the pg &E public safety power shutoffs and what those mean for our community. So, uh, we will get to presentations, and Jeff, if you can bring in Deputy Chief Aaron McAllister, uh, Chief Bachman, and Chief Peters, I will go off screen. We'll turn it over to them, and then we'll go presentation after presentation, but there'll be plenty of time for questions and comments from the council at the end of these, along with uh, questions or comments from our public. So thank you very much for having us tonight. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Let me do a screen share. Is that working? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, good evening. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Aaron McAllister. I'm the Deputy Chief at Contra Costa County Fire. And as Chief Aldred indicated, uh, I'm joined by two of my colleagues, uh, Chief Chris Bachman, who serves as our Fire Marshal, and Chief Jeff Peter is uh, relatively new to our organization. He oversees communications for us and uh, took the place of Chief Will Pigeon, who uh, recently left the organization and was our um, liaison to the City of Lafayette. And Chief Peter will be assuming uh, that role on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in his place. So in Lafayette, we are your fire department. The Contra Costa County Fire District has three fire stations in Lafayette. Um, hopefully you're looking at a map there on your screen. Uh, 15, 17, and 16 are in Lafayette, uh, but not uncommon to see Lafayette served by Station 2, Station 1, or Station 3. Uh, or even the Moraga Rinda, as we do uh, have a, a boundary drop with our neighbors and uh, uh, flow resources throughout our communities uh, throughout the day as demand uh, rises and falls. A couple of things I want to talk about tonight, uh, planning, preparedness, prevention, and emergency response. And I think we have some uh, new items in all of those areas that we want to highlight for you tonight. Uh, as we get to uh, some of the prevention slides, uh, Chief Bachman will be covering those. So what we saw last year was the new normal that has just continued to evolve. Um, around the firehouse, we frequently talk about career fires. We went to this very large fire and you're only gonna see that once in your career. Well, I've been to about 15 of those now that just keep getting larger and larger in terms of career fires. Um, I went to an incident last year uh, with the CAL FIRE incident management team in Humboldt County, Mendocino County. That fire was over a million acres. It took five incident management teams to zone that fire in different areas. 
something that most of us had never ever seen before in our careers, a million acre fire. Uh, the threat is real. Uh, much of our county is in a fire hazard severity zone. Uh, Lafayette specifically, especially on the northern side, is in a very high fire hazard severity zone. Uh, those zones are being updated by the state of California currently. So in the coming year, expect to see new zones with new areas added to those zones. Um, some of our early information indicates that um, much, many more areas will be added, including what we traditionally view as cities and subdivisions could be added to those zones if the buffer of high fire hazard severity zone or the wildland urban interface. Uh, as we saw in the North Bay the last few years, fire comes down into Santa Rosa proper, um, things like that. So if, if a, a traditional subdivision is near that interface, uh, we anticipate uh, many of those being included into severity zones that have traditionally been city limits and not included. Added to the complexity this year is the drought declaration by the governor recently added Contra Costa County to the current statewide drought declaration. Uh, this is a map hot off the press last week uh, released showing much of the Bay Area, actually all of the Bay Area under extreme drought conditions and parts of the state even under exceptional drought conditions. Looking back at 2020, we saw that preparedness and planning paid off in multiple situations. The, the photo you're, actually, you're looking at is actually a fire from early this year. Uh, so we had fires burning uh, in East County with intensity that we normally don't see until later in the fire season. Uh, this fire blew down into that neighborhood. You see some homes that are numbered there in the picture uh, homes three and six had taken some steps to protect their property, uh, have a buffer zone between the structures and the wildland urban interface, and those homes fared much better than homes four and five, where the fire actually got into the yard, did damage to fences, did damage to um, structures, sheds, and that, that type of thing that were on the back part of the property. So you can clearly see where a little bit of planning paid off for those residents for, for three and six. Uh, most of our wildfires were held to 10 acres or less in the county last year. We did not see a significant devastation. Uh, we did have the lightning strikes that came through our county and did have numerous starts within the county. Most of those were caught fairly small and we, uh, we didn't see the devastation that other counties saw last year. Uh, we participated uh, earlier this month in a meeting with the Weather Service where they called uh, last year's lightning event a 20-year event. So hopefully we don't see that with any frequency locally uh, and that that was a really an extraordinary event that we saw last year. A couple of figures for last year. We did see 18 total exterior fires. Uh, six were actual vegetation fires. Uh, one of those fires did involve a homeless person. One of those fires did involve a utility pole, but all of those incidents were brought under, under control relatively quickly. But make no mistake about it, um, there is the potential for serious devastation uh, in Lafayette, in Central County. The, the threat is real, the risk is real, and uh, we take a lot of steps to try to mitigate that risk. And talking about that will be Fire Marshal Chris Bachman. We'll cover the next few slides. So good evening um, to you know, kind of build on what uh, Chief McAllister was mentioning about the, the risks that exist. So the first thing we're doing uh, that we do every year is we um, promote and educate the public and enforce the uh, weed abatement standards for exterior hazards. And um, notices went out um, approximately, well, right at 30 days ago for East County because the deadline was Sunday and today was our first day for inspections out in um, East County of which we did, I believe it was 48 inspections today and only found um, four in non-compliance. So at over a 90% uh, success rate of compliance in the properties that we've already inspected on day one, we're very pleased with the results. 
um, that our residents throughout Contra Costa County and the east section are complying. Um, this deadline will, um, uh, will occur in the uh, central and west on, um, on May 26th. So on May 27th will be our first day that we'll be out inspecting in, in the central and, and west counties. So with that, uh, we, we, as I mentioned, we go out and we educate the public um, about the, the program. Um, we really encourage the voluntary compliance. Although if the compliance does not occur, then that's where the inspections come into place, which is what um, started today. And then if it ultimately gets down to that we have to do the enforcement, then uh, we have a contractor that we will uh, send out, write a work order and abate the property if necessary. So um, I'll make sure that you guys get a copy of this if, if you don't have a slide. Uh, we really like this slide because it's got the QR codes on it. And with the uh, QR codes, it'll either take you to our website, it will show you what our standards are and it identifies um, what the, the current threat that exists. So um, we like the, uh, this brochure because it provides the QR codes, which is a quick link to other resources and information uh, that's available um, uh, for you. I'm going to the next slide. So how are we doing? What's an additional thing we're doing new this year is we have implemented the Firewise program as it was uh, briefly discussed earlier. And um, so what we're doing is the district continues to work with city staff, Lafayette police and community organizations to promote Firewise. And we've made many improvements um, since last year by educating um, our citizens, uh, meeting with them. We've had great support with um, citizens reaching out to, as we mentioned, to Taylor King. We're very excited about the uh, extra staffing that we've added to the community risk reduction um, side of fire prevention, which is where FireWise, um, the division it's under. And uh, that includes um, hiring two additional people since last year under community risk reduction to both educate and enforce the, uh, the requirements um, with community risk reduction to make our community safer. Um, the, uh, all the material can be found on our website, either through the QR code. Um, Taylor is doing an excellent job uh, by educating the community and really pleased by um, the additional staffing that we've been able to put in that division to really give FireWise and community risk reduction the attention it needs to be able to educate our community, uh, both Lafayette and our communities uh, countywide that we serve. Thank you, Chief. Uh, cover some of our planning activities. Um, we may have spoken previously about the statewide pre-positioning program and uh, this past weekend, we actually used our first state funded pre-positioning uh, opportunity for the red flag event that was uh, here last weekend. Uh, the state funds additional dollars that go to local government so that we can staff up and provide surge capacity resources for known weather events uh, in anticipation of increased fire activity. So we added additional engines, we added uh, our hand crew was added and we put an extra dispatcher in our dispatch center to handle the potential extra call volume uh, if there was to be uh, a number of incidents or a single large scale incident. Uh, we did see several small fires that started over the weekend. Those resources responded to those incidents and everything was mitigated fairly quickly. So I don't think we even had a second alarm fire last weekend, but uh, Prepositioning does help us be prepared and we're thankful for that program funded by the state that allows some dollars to flow to local government uh, to give us that increased capacity. Uh, the residence guide is still available, uh, started by Lafayette, wonderful program, wonderful guide. Uh, we actually took that and took it state or sorry, countywide, uh, but that was started in Lafayette uh, with Chief Aldrit and that guide remains uh, very valuable to us and our residents. And then La Miranda started the, the pre-planned evacuation zones in your community. And so uh, I've got a couple slides coming up. They're gonna kind of give you a sneak peek on some of the coming technology and what we're gonna do with evacuation zones in Lafayette. Yeah, 
In terms of actually responding to incidents, we have a couple of things that are new. So you're aware that Fire Station was reopened in 2019. That gives us three full-time engine companies in Lafayette. Uh, Station 16 is in a high fire hazard severity zone, and we've already seen the increased response, or improved rather, response times uh, in the Fire Station 16 area by having that station restaffed. Crew 12. You may have heard that the state is short, uh, many, many hand crews for various reasons. Um, and they're trying to staff up by hiring seasonal wildland firefighters. Uh, Contra Costa County, we decided last year that we wanted to start our own wildland hand crew. And we did it as kind of a trial year last year with one hand crew. Uh, they were only available four days a week, um, but they were a huge help when they were available to us. These are, uh, firefighters who work seasonally for us in a full-time capacity, uh, they fight fire with wildland hand tools. They're not on a traditional engine or other apparatus, um, but they come to wildland fires, put in control lines uh, around the fire, and then help get municipal engine companies back in service faster so that they can respond to additional emergencies in the community. And they, they kind of handle the cleanup. They take care of... Uh, a lot of the mop up on the fire and, and really a lot of the heavy lifting. That program was so successful last year that we decided to double the number of persons we hire under that program and make it a seven day a week resource in our community so that we can continue to respond to wildland fires and be prepared uh, for significant incidents. Uh, we're always investing in our fleet. Over the last year, we took delivery of two type six wildland engines, a little smaller, a little more maneuverable, uh, two 2,000 gallon water tenders. And then uh, we did two years ago acquire a second bulldozer so that we can staff that second dozer on red flag events and, and have a little bit extra equipment available. Also Conair One last year had its first year with wildland firefighting in the county. Uh, it's a partnership with Reach Helicopter. Has a con fire captain on board that helicopter at all times. That captain can provide that aerial observation, command and control, uh, guide resources into incidents. Let us know what our priorities are. Uh, the captain has a better viewpoint in the air. And then uh, later this year, we're working on hoist rescue capability from that same helicopter. But, but having that asset available to us immediately within the county has been a huge boost to our wildland firefighting capability. In terms of technology, we've come a long ways in a short time. I really need to credit uh, Chief Aldrich and his staff that have worked so hard to make the Alert Wildfire Network uh, so robust. Two years ago, we had like one, maybe two cameras available to us in Contra Costa County. It was a huge blind spot for the camera network that is really exists up and down California today. Now we have so many more cameras available to us. and. Sorry to geek out on this a little bit, but I, I love hearing when we dispatch a fire, now I'm hearing our dispatchers reporting to the engine companies or the first end battalion chief that there's smoke showing on the camera. That tells me our dispatch center is using the cameras, focusing in on the incident. And we know very, very early, do we have a big fire? Do we have a little fire? Do we need to mobilize more resources or, or, or is this probably gonna be okay? So that early warning is a huge, huge help to us, both in response, but also detection as well. Um, we use a couple other tools for us to maintain situational awareness. That's tablet command is kind of our, our uh, computer aided dispatch platform. We've allowed access to tablet command to Chief Aldrich, some of his staff and county OES staff so that they can see the fire district activity. They have early warning, early notice that situational awareness, if we're gonna need evacuations, if we're anticipating a significant incident, basically they know what we know by reading those uh, notes through that platform. And then lastly, the community warning system. Um, Lafayette has some of the highest subscriber uh, ratios uh, for your community. And, and that is really the go-to platform if we need to initiate evacuations. So this is the sneak peek. I've got two more slides, I'm almost done, but this is the sneak peek for evacuation planning. 
You can see from this slide, there's a group of uh, firefighters gathered around the side of an SUV with a map on the side of the SUV. They're literally going to go up to that map and draw a box. Over on the right uh, is a picture from the uh, Million Acre Fire with a large scale map in a gymnasium at a fairgrounds. Um, that's evacuation planning, uh, how it happens today. And we're hoping to leverage some resources, some technology that's going to help us with evacuation planning. Some of those challenges today is that it's done on the fly, it's time consuming, and, and there's always different players involved. We want to take out some of that guesswork and incorporate that into some technology that we can put in the hands of the community warning system, law enforcement, and firefighters so that we're, we're literally all reading from the same sheet of music. We, we establish the evacuation zones and everybody instantly knows what they are. That way everybody can carry out their component of the mission in a much faster, safer way. You're aware of the residence guide. This is the go-to place so that uh, the community members can help themselves. A lot of good information in there in terms of uh, fire prevention material, as well as uh, uh, residential safety, uh, smoke alarm information and whatnot. And lastly, uh, we appreciate the partnership. Um, your PD has been fabulous. Chief Aldred has been fabulous. And uh, we, we couldn't do it without the partnership. And with that, um, the other chiefs and I are available for questions. Uh, Council, if you're good, we'll move to the next presentation and then we can hold questions again. Or if you want to change that up, Mayor, I'll leave it to your discretion. Um, no, I, th I think that was, that was a good suggestion because then we'll be able to hold all of our questions and the public questions at the same time. So just for the council, all panelists will be brought in at the end of the last presentation. So they'll all be available for questions at the same time. Thank you. Uh, next up, I'm happy to introduce uh, Duncan Siebert. Uh, Duncan, th the guide that got uh, discussed by Chief McAllister, uh, Duncan Siebert and the Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission. Um, that guy really should have Duncan's name on the front of it. He, he did the bulk of the work. Uh, the commission and I got to be there for the process and, and give feedback, but uh, Duncan was the one that really put a lot of labor of love into that product. Uh, along with uh, Dennis Rain, uh, Dennis Rain uh, serves in a capacity for us uh, through a grant that we receive every year from OES, and he assists our Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission. Uh, so both Duncan and Dennis will be presenting tonight. And just to clarify, they'll be presenting on both on behalf of the Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission, uh, which is a city commission appointed by the council, along with Law Marin Desert, which again, Duncan oversees Law Marin Desert and does all the training and all the work that goes into that. So I think Duncan's technically retired, but not really. Uh, we definitely keep him busy in this community in Law Marin Desert. So uh, Duncan and Dennis, over to you. All right. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Duncan's going to share his screen here real quick, and I'm going to start off by saying, uh, Mayor Kendall, members of the of the council, thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to to uh, bring you up to date on what the community and CERT and the Emergency Preparedness Commission have been doing. Um, I am the Emergency Preparedness Coordinator, and actually a, an employee of the Moraga Arenda Fire District. Uh, MOFD is the host for La Marinda CERT. Um, but we certainly have a number of community spark plugs throughout La Mirinda and especially in Lafayette. And as Ben said, uh, Duncan is one of the one of the main leaders. Duncan is our program coordinator, uh, program manager for La Mirinda CERT. So with that, uh, we'll go to the next slide and I'll turn this over to, to Duncan. Thank you, Dennis. Um, the Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission is uh, like other commissions in Lafayette, it's an all-volunteer commission, and it's charged with preparing the city's emergency operation plan and other associated plans. Uh, tonight, we'll be talking about the wildland fire evacuation plan. We started writing this plan, or we first presented the plan to, to council uh, in 2016. This is when we divided the city into 
the evacuation zones, we currently have 19 evacuation zones within the city. And these are the zones that allow easy communication between uh, fire, police, and the community warning system. Once Lafayette got this plan in place, then Arinda and Moraga used it as a model and other cities also. And now it's, it's the model that was used for the Zone Haven program that the county is now looking at or implementing. So Zone Haven is the, uh, it's going statewide. Moving on to CERT. Uh, CERT is the Community Emergency Response Team. We teach people to be prepared uh, for themselves because when a disaster strikes, the first responders aren't the first ones on site, but rather the citizens are the first on site. So we teach people how to do a, a minor version of what first responders do. Part of that is uh, fire, uh, fire safety. So we've done fire extinguisher training. It's part of the CERT training, but we also do it uh, by training the public at open houses, community uh, safety fairs, and other events. Dennis? All right. Um, so uh, along with the, the little bit of that we talked about, Zone Haven with Chief McAllister and, and Duncan, um, La Mirinda CERT has been a great supporter of evacuation exercises that have been both full scale uh, functional exercises and tabletop exercises and testing different portions of our evacuation capabilities. Um, the scenarios have generally been uh, based around wildland fires um, impacting the communities and uh, La Mirinda CERT um, um, helped with the Spring Hill evacuation back in on March 23rd of 2019. Um, there were 65 CERT members that assisted with uh, traffic control and a list uh, and logistics for the exercise. Uh, the slide that's on the screen right now is, is basically the, our gathering point, the command post, if you will, for that exercise. So in collaboration with Contra Costa County Fire, County Sheriff's uh, Search and Rescue, Lafayette Police Department, La Mirinda CERT, the residents of the Spring Hill neighborhood, um, we were able to implement a large scale evacuation very quickly. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons from that um, and everything up and into up and into and including contraflow traffic for the last few blocks of Spring Hill Road were implemented during that. Next slide. Next slide, Duncan. You got it. Here it comes. Are you so not saying that uh, uh, Duncan paid, played a key role in, but it was distributed through um, La Mirinda CERT with these, these um, kind of heavy duty signs that say either evacuated or need help. Um, these were, were printed locally. Uh, a thousand copies are available or made available for distribution. And the idea was the, to get neighbors um, to talk about evacuation, um, having something that you could distribute to your neighbors kind of gave you a platform for speaking about, well, are you ready for evacuation? And if you are, here's, you know, here's some things you can do. And here's a sign to kind of be able to put in front of your house that would save the police department or first responders time going to individual houses and checking on them. Duncan? Okay, go bags and evacuation preparedness. This, we teach this in CERT basic training and we, uh, we promote this all the time to have a go bag, whether you call it a go bag or a good bag, which is get out of Dodge or whatever name you call it, have a bag that will allow you to, to leave immediately, have it either in your car or close to your car. So when you get a call and you have 10 seconds to get out of the house, you can grab the bag and leave. When I work in, in wildfire shelters and I see the people who are coming into the shelters and they have just their, their night clothes on and they don't have prescription drugs, they don't have 
eyeglasses, they don't have any ID, they have nothing. And if their house burns down, as I've seen several happen, uh, they come out, they have nothing, no way to prove uh, that they lived in a house, that they had cars, they had, they have no way of showing who they are. So we, we really strongly suggest that people have a go bag ready to go, that it has a lot of items and you'll find lists of the items in later in this presentation. Another thing that La Miranda CERT has been doing is um, for the past six years, we've been selling water drums, the neighborhoods. It started out as just some of us decided to, to get together and, and see if we could get a, a better deal on drums by buying them together. And it's turned into almost a monster. We've sold over 20,000 drums. Um, that's almost 200,000 gallons of emergency drinking water uh, storage. We've donated to people in uh, paradise after the disaster when they were burned out and they got back in, but the water wasn't good to drink yet. So we gave them pallets of drums so that they could carry their drinking water with them. Uh, we have sales three times a year for water drums in various sizes. Dennis. All right, so a, a big part of emergency preparedness and being ready for that, that next wildfire is, is promoting what we call situational awareness. So CERT has always been a big promoter of, of having residents subscribe to Nixle for their communities. Um, so you know, part of our, our routine messaging is just text your zip code to 888-777 and, and actually subscribe to Nixel. And um, locally, I've even done that with people that were evacuated briefly from a wildfire and needed to get back in. And while I was escorting them back into their residence, I said, are you a Nixel? And they said, what? And I just, we did it on the way back to their house. So a very easy process and CERT has been instrumental in getting more folks registered for that. Um, CERT also maintains a, a very robust uh, call-out system to reach out to the, the CERT graduates in the community. And right now there's, there's over 700 in the community. And of those, um, there's probably 150 to 200 that we could probably get with a single call-out if we needed that many people. Um, and so that's just a simple uh, messaging system. Uh, uh, the CERT uh, team members are asked to call a central number and get an assignment or find out what the situation is. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had to use that other than exercises, but it's there if we need it. Um, CERT also is uh, one of the big promoters of having reg residents register for the county community warning system. Um, and then interestingly enough, there's a number of CERTs that are involved with ham radio and um, the GMRS radio, which is general mobile radio system which is a very open sort of FCC controlled radio system, but for a very low cost of a license, um, uh, uh, a whole family can get involved with that. Um, each of the La Mirinda communities has a, has a dedicated repeater up high on a mountaintop. Uh, the one in Lafayette is up at the top of Brown Avenue. Um, and one of the things that most recently kind of being developed as we speak is um, the ham radio folks in conjunction with CERT have developed a way to link those repeaters so that the repeater in Lafayette can talk to the one that's up at Grizzly Peak over Orinda and the one that's over at Alta Mesa in Moraga. Um, so that linking project is a little bit technical in that the FCC rules won't allow those um, repeaters to be linked by conventional radios. So they're, we're exploring and developing and should be just about ready to do testing on an internet linking system that uses some of the, the backbone uh, through Lafayette PD and some other, some other um, technology to link those repeaters. Uh, mostly they will be unlinked, um, but in a big emergency when we needed to connect residents um, and agencies throughout La Mirinda, uh, with, with a couple of, of internet clicks, uh, we'll be able to connect all of La Mirinda. And then uh, the ham radio communication nets, there's a, there's a ham net in La Mirinda um, once a week. 
And then finally, the, the little weather radio that you see down in the lower corner of the screen, um, CERT has, has been very good at promoting those weather radios to allow residents to get notifications even when their power is off, um, off the system that's located up on top of Mount Diablo. So next slide. Um, this is the, the La Mirinda uh, GMRS net. So you can see on the first Wednesday of every month, the Lafayette net is at 7.20 p.m. Um, and we do have a standardized channel plan for all of La Mirinda. So if you're in Moraga and, or Lafayette and you're at a school, channel 123 is the same in Moraga and Arinda and Lafayette. So that in a big emergency or a big incident, when a lot of people are trying to figure out what channel they should be on, uh, even if you don't have channel. Some of the other channels, 123 is the same all across Lafayette. So that's been a, a nice um, coordination event that started very from the beginning of our working with our ham radio partners. Next slide. For emergency generators, when we have a PSPS event or some other event where the, the power goes out, there's a lot of question about uh, what generator to buy, uh, what fuel source to use, so forth. So we have a, a guide. It's a, a four-page uh, instruction sheet that tells you not only how to select a generator, but also how to use one, uh, suggestions for how to use it. it. goes through the different fuels that you can use. You can have gasoline, which is problematic. You can have natural gas, which requires plumbing. You can have propane. You can even have diesel. So there are different options for power. Then you have to figure out how much power you need by going through your household uh, appliances to figure out the, uh, the power consumption of each, you add everything else. So this document takes you through all of that. And you can find that by going to lamarindacert.org to the resources tab and go down to generators and you'll find this document. Dennis? All right, and then um, one of the other things that CERT does is presents in-person meetings. Um, the first Monday night of every month is um, a CERT uh, update training, if you will. And, second. Um, second. Second month of every month. There have been no less than um, 13 uh, of those meetings that were two hours plus a piece that have been dedicated to wildfire preparedness since 2013. Um, we have a lot of we have a lot of interaction with residents during those, and, and the participants come from all over La Mirinda. Duncan. Finally, getting back, and Chief McAllister showed this. This is the residence guide that a uh, Lafayette Emergency Preparedness Commission put out in, uh, in cooperation with, with CERT and the cities and the fire district and MOFD. Um, much of it was personal experience that I had in working with evacuation uh, victims, people who were in shelters and we figured out what they, how they would have been better served had they been better prepared. So that was the, the original documents for this came from that, which I put out in CERT uh, several years ago. But we built on that as the commission and this is the document and it was mailed to every household in La Mirinda. And more copies are available at, at the PDs and the libraries. So thank you all. Uh, Chief, back to you. Thank you, Duncan and Dennis. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the wildfire guide and how you can get a copy if you don't have one or you lost it. We're happy to, we've got them right up front at the PD. And if you have mobility issues, we're happy to drop one off by your house. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, coming up next will be a presentation by Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E. Uh, with us tonight is Les Putman and Mark Van Gorder. And Jeff, if you can bring them on in.
Okay, Les, you're in, so uh, go ahead and unmute and turn your camera on, please. And Mark, you are muted as well. Hey, Jeff, are you able to unmute Mark? All right, are you able to see my screen? We did, but then it went away. Stand by one second. Sure. Let me, okay. Let's get Mark's audio uh, working here. So Mark, I need you to unmute. Okay, there you go. Okay, let's go ahead and share your screen again. Are you able to see that? Not yet. How about now? Not yet. Uh, Sure, let me try that again. There it is. Great. Mark, go ahead. Jeff, we can't hear Mark. He's unmuted on my end. He says his browser is blocking his audio. So um, I'll go ahead and start then instead of Mark. So we're gonna, we'll change it up just a bit. So um, thanks again, um, um, Mayor and City Council for allowing us to uh, be part of this presentation. We're really excited to be here and, and uh, talk about wildfire safety, the things pg and &E are doing to uh, keep the community safe uh, in Lafayette. Uh, my name is Les Putnam. I'm the local public safety specialist for PG&E. I serve Contra Costa County, and uh, my partner Mark Van Gorder is your local government relations and uh, public affairs person, uh, who uh, unfortunately replaces Tom Garino, uh, who passed away um, late last year. So I want to start with uh, talking about the types of outages we, we uh, anticipate in uh, 2021 and much similar to what we had in last year. Um, we first start off with rota rotating outages. This is what most people um, call brownouts. And this is not a PG&E uh, initiated outage. This is an outage that the Casio or the uh, multiple state uh, electric grid system uh, initiates based on the use of electricity in the western part of the um, United States. Um, and when we uh, look at a Casio um, um, outage, we typically will, pg &E will notify our customers via phone calls, emails, texts, social media, uh, news releases, uh, and, and make them aware of the outage and give them an, uh, an update. We also have uh, all that information on our uh, website, pg and backslash uh, wildfires, and within that, you'll be able to see uh, the outage information for the Casio or brownouts as, we're, as we um, are know them. We also okay, have yes. emergency. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yeah, Mark, is that you? Yes, I apologize. If I, if I could just introduce myself briefly and, and maybe we, I can pick up where we left off. Go ahead. I hate to cut you, cut in midstream. I, and I apologize, Mayor. Uh, City manager and, and council members, um, technical difficulties with Zoom. I haven't experienced that before, but I do want to introduce myself. I work with Les, our public safety specialist. My name is Mark, and as, as Les said, you know, um, no one can re replace Tom Greeno, so I'm I'm here uh, uh, trying to fill his shoes, and um, I will be your primary contact for public affairs and local government relations. I am trying to get up to speed uh, in the Contra Costa area, but I've been representing Marin and Napa counties uh, for the past almost coming up on eight years now. Um, Les, did you want me to continue through this slide in the next two, or do you want to? No, go up? ahead, Mark. Go ahead, Mark. You got it. Sure. So, 
So we uh, we know we're we're trying to keep time uh, moving along here, council members, and I will try and go quickly. Um, primarily, we're here tonight to talk about uh, our partnership with the city, uh, our incident command system, and and the way we work with the county office of emergency services and with your uh, public safety uh, leaders, uh, chief of police and fire chief. Um, but to start with, we wanted to make sure that the community knows, as I'm sure most do, that we have a number of different outages, as this slide shows. And so we're going to get into the public safety power shutoffs uh, in just a minute. But it is very common as we get to this time of year, people will say, ah, my power is out. It, I've, I've heard about wildfire season. Um, you know, is it, is it a public safety power shutoff? <clears throat> and so uh, we have a number of links at the end of this slide. And... Uh, helpful links, I think, for people to look up outages, why they're occurring and happening. We will, as, as Les was mentioning, provide a tremendous amount of community outreach uh, prior to an outage. So there can be outages for a number of reasons, all listed here on this slide. I believe this slide deck is available on, on your website as a, as a presentation or, or, or can be made available to the public if they wish. And then, um, Les, I didn't know, uh, if, if uh, you have control to go to the next slide or does the city clerk running the slide I, I deck? Next slide, I have control. All right, great, thank you. So again, we'll, we'll, we'll move through this quickly. There was a time when this was all new to me, uh, it seems like just three years ago. I, I think a lot of folks are familiar with these uh, conditions, so I'll cover them briefly. But if we have very low humidity, um, we say 30% and below, but I think, you know, we start getting into the 20 and teens. We know we've got very low humidity. High winds, red flag warning. Uh, the, the fuel on the ground is very, very dry. It's already very dry. Um, you've already heard that from, from your public safety partners there. And we have people making both on the ground real-time uh, observations. And we have a number of weather stations in the area. So, again, something you are familiar with. Um, and we also have links to weather, weather uh, live weather where people can go look at the conditions in the area on their own. So next slide, Les. So getting into primarily what, what we're here tonight to talk about. How do we communicate with the, with the community? Uh, and then more importantly, how we partner and plan in, and coordinate in advance. So for those who don't already know in the community who are watching and listening, uh, our objective is to provide information in emails, text, voice messages, in some cases where we have people uh, that we're aware of on medical baseline. Uh, and I'm sure uh, there are probably active members with the CERT team that, that, that do similar things. We will go door to door knocking uh, if we do not receive information. Sorry, if we don't receive a confirmation via email or text or flown from those people. Um, that's all what happens right here on this slide. We have a two days notice, we, we follow up one day, uh, and then just before several hours, the power goes out uh, for safety, then we patrol. So the power will continue to be off until we patrol to make sure there's no damage to the lines, and then we'll, then we'll restore. <clears throat> what Les is gonna get into in just a second here, is, is the planning ahead of time, the partnership, the coordination, both in the, you know, what we're trying to do to reduce the number of public safety power shutoffs, mitigate fire uh, potential, coordinate, communicate, and plan with public safety partners, both at your city level and, and the County Office of Emergency Services. So with that, I will turn it over to Les and of course available to answer questions later. Great, thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, so, things that we are working, uh, continually working on to reduce the uh, potential for wildfire in all communities, uh, including Lafayette. Uh, so, uh, on a routine basis, annually we inspect our um, our assets, including our poles, our towers, our, our wires, uh, to make necessary repairs. We also have a uh, robust vegetation management program. Uh, we on at least once a year, and, and sometimes multiple times a year. Uh, we'll uh, re-inspect the vegetation close to our poles, both transmission and distribution, and um, make the, uh, the vegetation changes uh, as necessary according to CPUC guidelines. Uh, we also are uh, in the process of um, hardening our system 
And we do this a lot of ways. This includes a stronger, uh, bigger, thicker poles, different types of material in our poles so that the poles won't snap during heavy winds. Um, also, um, for wildfire safety, by coating our wires with uh, plastic and, and other materials so that the, uh, they, when they slap together during the winds, they don't produce arcing, creating potential for a wildfire. Uh, and then we have targeted device replacement, which basically means uh, we are upgrading uh, various shutoff devices and uh, uh, everything from transformers to um, make them wildfire safe, as well as um, make sure that they're up to date in, in, in all areas. And then the, lastly, in our toolbox for wildfire uh, re reducing potential would be the use of a public safety power shutoff. And obviously everybody knows when we have these severe conditions, we have to revert to a public safety sh uh, power shutoff, and that becomes the tool um, to, to protect everybody from the potential from a wildfire. Other improvements uh, in, in situational awareness, we have a 24-7 operational, what we call um, Wildfire Safety Operations Center. It's actually now being um, termed a HAWC or a um, All Hazards Operational Center. So it's 24-7, um, 12 months a year, we're um, able to keep our eyes uh, on all types of weather conditions. Uh, we use um, uh, meteorologists within pg e We use our weather stations, which are throughout our territory, and our high-definition cameras to monitor uh, weather and fire conditions. And as uh, Chief McAllister mentioned, the, the high-definition cameras are um, throughout uh, Contra Costa County. I'll get to another slide on that. But those are um, mainly pg e um, uh, financed and, and we work with, um, in particular Lafayette in the Lafayette area, uh, Lieutenant Cornell has been instrumental in helping us get those cameras in, in various locations. Uh, we also use um, state-of-the-art satellite detection for uh, fire detection. Uh, we can see a start um, uh, as, as small as two to three acres uh, and, and we can assist in the local agencies in getting resources to that fire in a timely manner. In order to reduce the impacts of a PSPS event, uh, we focus typically in the high risk areas, so that would be your tier two and tier three areas. Uh, this is where a lot of our work uh, is, is being done to reduce the risk of wildfire. Uh, and then we're continuously uh, looking at and reaching out to our partners uh, in the public and private sector to get feedback on how we're doing and, and make improvements as we get uh, through um, to the uh, prepare for the next season. So just wanted to um, give also uh, an overview on what are uh, what we what we call our community resource centers? Uh, we currently have uh, 33 locations in Contra Costa County and two located in Lafayette. Uh, once again, uh, Lafayette PD has been instrumental in, in allowing us to uh, place these community centers uh, in Lafayette. We have one at the Lafayette Community Center, which is an indoor facility, which is now uh, event ready, meaning it has a generator in place. Uh, and then we have an outdoor facility that we can uh, upscale at our Savior's Lutheran, Lutheran Church. Um, and this would be in the event that we have a PSPS um, situation at these CRC locations, our generators where uh, citizens and customers can come out to get uh, devices generated, um, um, health equipment um, uh, charged up. They can get their phones charged up. Uh, there's water, snacks and um, other things there for them to uh, get information uh, regarding the event itself. As a side note, uh, we currently this year uh, have decided to uh, scale up our CRCs in what we call all hazard events. So in uh, not just the PSPS event, but wildfires, um, earthquakes, any other major event that affects the area, uh, we would uh, staff a CRC and make that available to the community. So I wanted to uh, give a, a brief, quick overview on uh, things that we've done uh, in Contra Costa, and then I'll scale that down to the um, Lafayette area. System, system hardening-wise, uh, again, this is the stronger poles covering our lines, targeted undergrounding. We've completed 15 miles of that work in Contra Costa County, and uh, an additional two miles planned for 2021. Regarding that, we have about three miles of uh, system hardening in uh, the Rossmore uh, Lafayette area, which includes the Rossmore substation and one of our um, power power lines that uh, covers that area. And that hardening um, includes re removing and updating the poles. And again, 
I'm putting the uh, insulation on the wires to keep the wires from potentially sparking during uh, heavy winds. We've in, uh, installed 39 sectional, uh, sectionalizing devices uh, throughout Contra Costa County, three of those in the, in the Lafayette area. Uh, and regarding uh, our vegetation, we have completed uh, 86 miles of uh, vegetation management in Contra Costa. And uh, currently we are up to date and completed within the Lafayette area for all of our tier one, tier two, and tier three vegetation. I mentioned the community resources. Again, we have um, you know, 10 outdoor and two indoor facilities, um, two of which uh, are in the Lafayette area. Weather stations, we have 33 um, throughout the county. The weather stations are um, available to the public for uh, the microclimate weathers that we have throughout um, uh, California. And you can uh, look at those at pge.com backslash weather. And um, you can log into that and see what the current weather is at each of these locations. And again, the fire service um, and um, in, in pg e uses this information to determine um, the, the conditions on the ground and whether or not we're going to start deploying or a PSPS event or, or any of the other things that we need to do to mitigate uh, and keep the area safe. High definition cameras, uh, once again, there are um, 10 cameras in Contra Costa, four more planned. Uh, we currently have uh, one in the immediate Lafayette area, and all these cameras are um, used to get uh, early information on fire start location and conditions uh, are easily reported uh, uh, over the cameras and gives the uh, responding agencies um, a real good view of what's going on before they even get those resources on the incident. So the, uh, that completes our um, our immediate uh, presentation on the wildfire um, safety that we have here. Chief, if you'd like to take that over, um, we're open for questions at the end of the um, evening. All right, thank you both. Uh, we'll be moving on to East Bay Mud or our East Bay Municipal Utility District. And uh, Jeff, if you can bring in Scott Hill and Brett Kawakami. All right. They'll be in momentarily, stand by. Okay, they should be in. And Jeff, if I could just note real quick, uh, yeah. I appreciate Scott Hill and John Coleman from East Bay Mud. Uh, this was a last minute request for them to join us. And so thank you for them to them for being available tonight. Uh, and there were some questions from the public regarding East Bay Regional Parks District. Um, they were not able to make it tonight, but they have said they'll be available at a future city council meeting if the council does requ request that. So just to make sure they get a little bit of credit, they were gonna try to make it, but thank you to East Bay Mud for being here tonight. You're welcome. All right, so Scott, let me know if this is coming up. It's in stereo. Oh, there we go. That looks good, Brett. Um, be, before we get started, um, let me allow me to introduce myself. I'm Scott Hill. Um, I'm the manager of Watershed and Recreation for East Bay Mud. And before I forget, uh, Director John Coleman asked me to let you know that uh, he's tied up in a Durwa meeting, but that he'll, he will be attending uh, this council meeting just as soon as he's done. Um, I didn't want to forget that important piece of information. So Brett and I have prepared for a five minute presentation. So <laughs> we're gonna, we should be able to get through this rather quickly, even though um, I can be wordy. Um, so let's see, go to the next slide, please, Brett. Thank you. Um, so at East Bay Mud, um, you know, on the, on the watershed in particular, we, we basically have a two tiered approach. We have a fire management plan, which really addresses vegetation management on the watershed lands uh, in Contra Costa and Alameda County. And then also in the developed recreation areas, uh, and of particular interest to this group, I would imagine, is the Lafayette Reservoir. Um, 
and that that plan employs uh, you know many different many different techniques to address the different vegetation that uh, occurs on our watershed lands uh, to reduce the the fuel hazard. And then, in addition to the vegetation management plan, we also maintain and update annually a fire response plan, and that really addresses uh, the preventative measures that we take as well as um, the response that we we're capable of providing to a wildland fire. It is a policy of East Bay Mud that we respond to uh, all wildland fires on the district watershed land and any fire threatening the district watershed land within a quarter of a mile and up to a half a mile away during red flag conditions. Um, all the rangers are certified wildland firefighters and we also have um, brush patrols, which are pickup trucks equipped with small pumper units that are uh, very effective for a pump and run type operation and very efficient for suppression in grassland uh, situations. In addition to, to that fleet at the Lafayette Reservoir in particular, we have a resident ranger who lives on site uh, Lafayette also has a, uh, a fire brush patrol that is on site at all times. Um, in, in addition to, to that level of preparedness uh, in terms of, of prevention, we have a fire a weather management plan uh, that we monitor during fire season. It's updated three times a day, and we use that information. It, it's uh, fire hazard calculations that we use to make decisions regarding uh, restrictions or closures in the developed recreation areas, such as Lafayette Reservoir or on the watershed trail systems. Um, what else do we have going on? Um, as was mentioned earlier um, about the um, alert wildfire, Fire technology. We've been working with uh, John Cornell from Lafayette PD to try and um, get cameras up at some strategic locations uh, on the watershed land to complement those that are already in place. Uh, and that's a very promising technology, as, as others before me have discussed, both in terms of, of size up uh, as well as uh, strategy uh, when you've responded to an incident. A uh, very helpful tool. Um, I think really um, we can go to the next slide. I think we, we only have a couple of slides. This is just a, another slide just showing some of the fuel, the fuel break work um, that we do. This is, is just showing some uh, livestock grazing and then also one of the one of our mowers coming down the road, um, essentially doing a roadside treatment. Um, we have a system of fire road that we maintain throughout the watershed. It's 150 miles long, and it serves a, a very important purpose of allowing safe access for first responders, firefighters, to getting in and around the watershed, in addition to providing uh, control lines uh, to check the spread of a wildfire. Um, so this mower is in the process of doing some road tri roadside treatment to further enhance the holding capacity of that fire road. We grade those fire roads annually uh, down to mineral soil to ensure that they're safe ingress and egress for wildland fire response uh, and, and also to uh, ensure their efficacy as control lines. And, and that's in certain cases, they may need to be augmented by mowing and reducing the fuel on either side. And that's what's going on in this picture. Um, in addition to, to the other, uh, preventive measures that I mentioned, we do maintain a watershed patrol um, 365 days of the year. Uh, every day we have a patrol person on the watershed during red flag conditions, that patrol is augmented. Uh, so we have numerous patrols out there for early detection and response to fires that may occur on our, on our watershed land. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, uh, Brett, to talk to you about uh, PSPS preparedness at East Bay Mine. 
Thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you for having us uh, uh, at your meeting to present uh, on our, um, you know, fire management and uh, PSPS preparedness topics. So I have just a couple slides, and um, what I'm going to do is just tell you, um, you know, how we're prepared to respond to the public safety power shutoff events that uh, pg e discussed a couple of presentations ago. So we do have a number of facilities that are affected by uh, the PSPS events. Uh, the, for the most part, um, you know, our water system flows by gravity. It goes all the way from our, our party reservoir um, up in the McCullum water, watershed, goes through our treatment plants. But then at some point, uh, we do need to pump water up into higher elevations, into our reservoirs. And that is where uh, one of our uh, most critical needs are when it comes to reliable power. And so that is one of the, one of the areas where we have uh, taken uh, many steps to make sure that we're prepared in the event of a PSPS. So as you all know, the, the PSPS is a proactive de-energization in order to prevent catastrophic wildfires. And one of the, this, this diagram is taken from one of our brochures, basically shows how our distribution system works, where we have a series of pumping plants, which pump water up to higher and higher zones and to fill our reservoirs. And then th that water is released from those reservoirs to serve the neighborhoods for both for public consumption and provide reserves for firefighting. So a couple of the steps that we do uh, to prepare for PSPS and, and just fire season in general, whenever there is uh, red flag type conditions, we always fill our reservoir our, our uh, water tanks to um, high, very high capacity and keep them uh, at that level until the danger passes. And during PSPS season, we also deploy uh, and utilize generators uh, that which are deployed at our, at our pumping plants. So we have about 60 pumping plants that are, that are potentially affected by PSPS events. These all tend to be in the high fire risk areas. And so what we've done is basically we have some standby permanent generators, but to augment uh, those generators, we actually deploy temporary generators during the PSPS season for backup power and um, we have actually uh, gone out and secured a three-year rental contract uh, for the, to provide generators for the next three uh, fire seasons. And typically we deploy about 30 pumping, uh, 30 generators to, to uh, serve our critical pumping plants and make sure that we can maintain reliable water service. Um, so, so one of the things that we do, we have a pretty, we have a pretty comprehensive outreach program uh, in terms of uh, PSPS events. And one thing that we do is we our, ask our customers to limit discretionary water use, uh, such as outdoor irrigation. The main reason being that that helps us keep water in our reservoirs uh, during a PSPS event. So impacted customers are asked to minimize their water usage. And we actually have a website that uh, during a PSPS season shows, during, during a PSPS event shows the potentially impacted areas. So customers can go and see if, if you know, they're in one of those areas affected by PSPS events. This communications strategy has proven effective in past PSPS events as customers have conserved up to 30% uh, during an actual PSPS event. So again, that's for the good of everyone and it helps us just keep the the water in the reservoir is available for firefighting and also make sure that we keep the system pressurized for public health uh, and make sure we can deliver reliable water service to our customers. So we've had uh, a very good success in the past two years. Uh, we've been affected by five PSPS events and during each of those events we've been able to maintain 100% re reliable water service to our customers with no impacts to the distribution system and um, the keys to our success have been pre-deployment of the generators, good communications. We have a good partnership with PG&E. Uh, we work with them during the off season and participate in working groups, emergency exercises, and we have established uh, very good contacts over there at PG&E. And so uh, it has, has all helped us to be, to, um, be, um, or be successful. And we anticipate going forward, uh, we will be able to maintain that success as well. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'm sorry to take any questions at the end. Thank you. 
All right, thank you both. Uh, John, or excuse me, Jeff, if you wanna bring in uh, John Cornell, we'll kick off the last presentation and then we'll be able to move to questions. Uh, I will kick off and then John will uh, come in here towards the end and share his screen, Jeff, when I wrap up mine. All right, Jeff, you look good. I think you're uh, good to go. All right. Well, we'll start off with the scary photo. Uh, if you recall, this was a photo from the uh, October 2019 fires that we had uh, here in Lafayette. Um, when we talk about preparedness and response, um, you know, we were talking about the 2021 season, but I just, for all the agencies present, uh, this is something that just didn't start this year. We've been working on this over the last several years. As you recall, council in 2019, uh, based on one of the council objectives, we were challenged uh, by the council and then Mayor Anderson to say, can you put all this great information for our residents in one location? And that's where the La Merida Residents Guide to Wildfire Preparedness Evacuation was started. Um, we have plenty of these copies left over. If you come by the Lafayette Police Department, we have a box out front with the guide there. Uh, if you uh, have mobility issues or can't make it down to the police department, you can email us at 94549tip at gmail.com and we'd be happy to have one delivered to your home. But this really contains a lot of great information to help you and your family be better prepared uh, ahead of the emergency. Uh, we're going to start with talking about the community warning system. Again, this was a 2019 project where in February 2019, we only had approximately 3,000 signups in our community. And they measure signups by households. And so to put that relationship, we have approximately 10,000 households in Lafayette. So we had about 30% of the folks signed up. Uh, and that partnership with our community, we kicked it off. And we're now we're at over 8,700 signups in Lafayette. And we're very proud of that. Our community definitely leads the way in this county with uh, residents being signed up. I would encourage folks watching this, uh, if you have any questions about CWS, they have a great website at cwsalerts.com. You can register, learn more. It talks about the numbers that'll pop up. If you're getting a phone call or a text message from alert, excuse me, from community warning system. So they continue to put new information out there. So please visit that website to better understand uh, what the alerts like when they come to your phone. Uh, as far as, excuse me, as far as PSPS preparations, I'm gonna go back and forth a little bit between fire and PSPS. Um, we've done a lot of things and John's going to talk about some of the equipment that we've added to our city arsenal over the last couple of years that must be better prepared for emergencies, for power outages. Uh, but one of the things we're really proud of is uh, last year we were able to install eight key intersections with a intersection power tap. And these are the intersection below and John and I are working on a project to try to get every intersection with uh, traffic lights installed with a power tap. What this allows us to do is uh, during a power outage, whether it's due to PSPS or any other emergency or just uh, maybe PJ is working on a project and instead of having people out there doing traffic control, we can bring on a generator, power that intersection with full traffic signals, full rotation uh, for, for days at a time if need be. And so that's been a good thing. And this improves not only public safety, but uh, in the event that we have to do evacuations to give us better control of those intersections. Um, zone Haven has been touched on tonight, so I'm not going to go too much more in depth, but really the big thing with Zone Haven is La Miranda has been ahead of the curve on having evacuation zones, and Zone Haven is really taking, helping us take that to the next level and leverage those zones we have and use them better and more efficiently in the coming years. And I'm excited that Zone Haven is doing this project for all of Contra Costa County. I think the big win in having evacuation zones throughout our county, not just in certain cities in Contra Costa County, is it'll prove our mutual aid response. So if every city is used to having uh, evacuation zones, they're numbered uh, consistently or, or, or labeled consistently throughout the county, I can have a Walnut Creek, a San Juan police officer come in and we're all speaking the same language because Zone Haven will become countywide, not just limited to La Miranda or or evacuation zone not being just limited to the La Miranda. So in response to, or in the terms of mutual aid, I think this will be a big win moving forward. Uh, Jeff Heyman and John Cornell really get the credit for this with the support of our city council. 
uh, Jeff uh, launched our City of Lafayette Emergency Alert a AM radio station. And this is a photo of one of the signs you'll see here in Lafayette as you're driving in on Pleasant Hill Road. Advertise the Lafayette community and emergency information. You can tune in to AM 1670. This really came out of the October 2019 fires when one of our uh, major cell phone uh, tower locations in La Miranda, or excuse me, in Lafayette was compromised. And our ability to communicate out uh, and residents to get information was severely hampered. And as you know, if you live out in some of the different areas of Lafayette, cell phone reception is, is not that great. And the idea with AM radio station is that uh, we can get information to more folks more readily, uh, whether it's just daily or an emergency basis. And um, really excited about that. And that, that uh, location or the, the AM radio station is housed at Lafayette PD and was uh, installed by John Cornell. Um, really proud of a grant that we were able to obtain through the Cal OES Community Power Resilience Allocation to Cities Program, a very long title. Uh, we did apply in the prior fiscal year and did not receive a grant, but uh, I submitted it back in October 2020 and we were notified about a month and a half ago that we are a recipient to the tune of $250,000 uh, to help us be better prepared uh, for power outages. Uh, the items that we're gonna be utilizing to that money for uh, is to purchase 20 portable radios. These are radios that will be operating on the eBrick system for Alameda and Contra Costa County. This is the radio system, which all police law, excuse me, police fire and emergency services operate off of. And so these radios are basically mini version of the police radios that my officers carry. And so it's supported on a network that's very, very reliable. And these radios will be disseminated to every school site, along with our superintendent's locations, and along with uh, to also all of our city department heads. Uh, again, coming out of October 2019, uh, our city manager, Naroop, along with one of our principals, was working to set up a, an evacuation location for residents. And our ability to communicate between her and I was severely hampered. And so by having radios on a reliable system, uh, your city leadership, you also acts as emergency service workers, can have better communication with your police and fire, and also allows our schools to have better communication with each other during emergencies, whether it's a lockdown, whether it's shelter in place, it gives your superintendents the ability to communicate with the school sites, do a sit rep, see what the needs are, and then communicate those out to your police and fire departments. Uh, we're also looking at installing uh, more, excuse me, mobile radio bases in all of our School buses, the La Miranda school bus program is operated out of the city of Lafayette in partnership with Moraga and Narenda. And currently we don't have the ability to communicate directly with them. And so this will enhance our, uh, the safety for our students, but also the ability to potentially use those buses during evacuation scenarios. Uh, we're also going to be installing a solar system and a propane generator at the city public works uh, location. Um, Anytime we have a PSPS event or other emergencies, Public Works works hand in hand with the police department. So we need their location to be uh, sustainable uh, for long periods of time so they can be partnered with us during these emergencies. And then lastly, we'll be purchasing another towable diesel generator that allows us to set up another uh, resource center if needed, uh, in addition to the one that's set up at the community uh, center. And just to give credit to uh, ACE, and his team, uh, the CRC or the Community Resource Center, the Lafayette Community Center was a project that was taken on by ACE. I got a little bit of credit earlier on, but uh, Jonathan and his team really deserve the credit for that project and working through that. Uh, alert wildfire cameras have been discussed frequently tonight. Uh, in November of 2019, uh, we had zero or maybe one camera in all of Contra Costa County in this program. Uh, John's going to jump on here in a minute and discuss a little more detail about Alert Wildfire and really where this started and where it comes from. But uh, I'm happy to say as of May of 2021, we've installed over 30 Alert Wildfire cameras across both Alameda and Contra Costa County. Um, and I would encourage all of our residents to visit alertwildfire.org. If you click on the upper left and select the South and East Bay, you can view the cameras are installed in and around the La Marina area. Uh, several cameras are on public, or excuse me, on private property, and so those are not viewable uh, to the public. Uh, those are partnerships with private landowners who agreed to allow us to install a camera, but it's only accessible by police and fire. 
Um, but several of the cameras are public facing. Um, those images update every 10 seconds. So if you hear about a fire in the Lumber Miranda area, I can almost promise you that there will be an alert wildfire camera pointed at it. So if you're a resident who's concerned because you smell smoke, you've heard about a fire, go to alertwildfire.org and you'll have about as much um, information as I have operating out of the police department on what's going on. Along with that, I would encourage, uh, I believe Chief McAllister mentioned Pulse Point. Uh, if you've not downloaded the Pulse Point app, I really encourage you to do that. And between Pulse Point and alertwildfire.org, uh, as a resident in your home wanting to know what's going on, it'll give you a lot more transparency and understanding of, of what's going on during an emergency or a fire. Uh, before I kick it over to John, one of the things we wanted to point out tonight is, is all the entities representing repre tonight, we don't operate in, in a silo or in a bubble. Um, we build these relationships ahead of the crisis. Um, your Contra Costa County Fire Department and Police Department work closely together on a variety of topics, both emergency preparedness, wildfire, uh, wildfire response uh, to active shooter training. And building those relationships ahead of time is important, not waiting until a crisis. And so uh, I'm thankful for all those that presented tonight and the relationships we've established ahead of the crisis so we can be better prepared and I'll just wrap up with this. Um, one of the questions that come up a lot of times is how do we communicate as a city or as a police department in, in various emergencies? And as your police chief, I have a sort of a tier system, if you will. The community warning system is at the very top. If you're getting an alert from the community warning system, things are bad. You need to be uh, getting prepared. You need to be ready to evacuate or maybe actually evacuating. The next level below the community warning system is Nixle. And we utilize Nixel very discriminately because we don't want you to get so bombarded with Nixels that aren't of an emergency nature that you start to ignore them. So we limit it to long-term road closures. Um, hey, there's a red flag warning for this weekend. We want you guys to be aware, high fire danger. Um, but Nixel is right below CWS. And then below that is the social media platforms that are available both to the police department and the city of Lafayette. Um, and so, if you don't hear from me on CWS, there's a reason. If you don't hear from me on Nixle, there's a reason. Go to our social media, but that is the tier system that we operate on uh, when we're sharing information with our community. Uh, John, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen and talk a little bit more about Alert Wildfire, and then we'll turn it back over to the council for questions. All righty, thank you, Chief. Let me get my video going here. Can everybody see me? And as John's getting set up, um, just for everyone, this is John Cornell from the Lafayette Police Department. Uh, he serves in the role as a police services assistant. Um, our police services assistant position includes police technology, uh, department of technology, along with uh, crime scene investigators, et cetera. But um, the program that John's talking about, a lot of the activities that have come out, your, out of your police department is because the council lets me have someone on staff like John. Um, normally a small police department wouldn't have their own IT folk person on hand. who's also certified to climb towers and et cetera, et cetera. So um, thank you to the council and the community. This is one of the things that comes out of us being able to think outside the box in, in Lafayette. So thank you for that. All right, thank you, Chief. And good evening, everybody. I'm gonna jump right into it. The chief has given me a strict uh, time limit, so I'm going to try and cover everything, and then obviously if there's questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. Um, before we jump into Alert Wildfire, I will touch on some of the other um, resources that we have in the city that we've been able to acquire and set up, uh, not just for wildfires, but also any um, you know disaster that we might be working with. Um, a few of those uh, that we've kind of adapted for situations like the chief mentioned when we had a cell phone tower go down. Um, we actually now have the ability to set up uh, our own charging and re uh, cell phone reception um, center, if you will. It's essentially a satellite powered uh, cell phone tower that we own and we maintain. And what that would allow us to do is set up uh, in an evacuation zone um, or an evacuation center uh, basically a small cell phone tower that would allow people to get out a basic phone call or text, uh, along with Wi-Fi to check, um, you know, updates 
it's not for Facebook, it's not for YouTube, but just to be able to communicate out and tell family, friends, loved ones that you're okay, let them know where you are. Um, when people get evacuated from their homes, it could be an hour, it could be a day. Uh, and we just wanna make sure that everybody um, has that ability uh, to communicate. Um, we have a portable air conditioning system uh, that would also be used more in an evacuation setting. Uh, we can set that up in a, a building it will cool up to 10,000 square feet, uh, totally self-sustaining. Uh, we don't need power. We don't need anything. Uh, we run a couple of HVAC lines, uh, just big ducting into the open door, open window, um, and we're able to create our own air-conditioned space using that. Um, we have a lot of portable lighting, portable power, again, more for setting up a, a, an evacuation center. Uh, or a meeting center um, and in the PSPS time, that's kind of where that would play in. We could take a parking lot and turn that into a meeting zone, uh, well-lit area for people to gather if we needed to. Um, kind of going back to the cell phone side, we do have uh, our own satellite internet connection. Um, it's a high-speed internet connection uh, that we can set up uh, within about 10 minutes. That's more for like an incident command uh, for our chiefs, you know, fire, police, public works, um, to be able to communicate out uh, and, you know, get updates, send notifications, um, and that sort of thing. So that's uh, just additional to, like the chief mentioned, the power taps for the uh, intersections. Uh, that's one of our, um, you know, biggest uh, accomplishments, I think, for the PSPS side. All of our public works uh, members are trained on how to put those generators out, how to fill them up. Um, and how to get them going so that we can have operation, uh, operational signals throughout the city and keep traffic moving. Uh, I'm gonna jump over to Alert Wildfire uh, just real quick. Uh, we'll cover this. I'm gonna, obviously it's been touched on a lot in this um, meeting. I'll get into just a few of the details about what it is, how it works. Um, it, it really is a, a program that has kind of changed the way that we view uh, fires and, and other emergencies. Um, so Alert Wildfire, it's cooperation um, that we started back in 2019 with the organization. This kind of goes over um, how it started. It was started in 2013. It was called Alert Tahoe. Um, it began uh, from University of Nevada, Reno, Uni uh, UC San Diego, and then um, a couple of universities in Oregon. And essentially they all banded together and said, we want to try and make this project happen. Um, they wrote uh, the web page for it. They figured out how to make the cameras uh, send the data to it. Uh, and then it just kind of exploded from there. In 2019, um, the city of Lafayette reached out and said, how can we get a couple of these cameras uh, around our area? Um, and Alert Wildfire was happy to send us a few and say, if you can get them installed, we'll put them on the website and you guys can use them for um, wildfire preparedness. Uh, so in uh, 2019, 300 new cameras were installed, and then uh, essentially 300 new cameras will be installed in 2020 and 2021, and then from there, the, um, they'll just keep filling in the holes. Um, I'll stop on this picture. This is more just an example of where we install them. So the cameras, uh, there's currently 24 cameras actually in Contra Costa County alone. 13 of those um, have some sort of impact on the La Mirinda area. So whether it's in the Briones uh, Valley or in the Las Trompas uh, area, um, kind of the two uh, wilderness areas that butt up against us, um, we do have 13 cameras that cover that. Most of those are in the Oakland Hills. And then there are a few that are actually like the chief said on private property uh, in the middle of Briones in the middle of Las Trompas and they cover um, a large area that we'd be able to see uh, a fire start. Um, the cameras are installed on existing towers. We try to find tower uh, antenna towers that uh, are already existing so that we don't have to go through and get permits for that. Um, as uh, Scott Hill said from East Bay Mud, we are working with them to try and get some cameras up on their water towers and their existing infrastructure. Um, and just to kind of like us fill in the holes uh, of where we don't have coverage. Uh, this image you're looking at is our round top location. This is our primary location for La Marinda. It covers uh, Lafayette, Arinda, and Moraga. Uh, up in the top left corner, you can see the reservoir. And in the top right hand corner, that's um, the uh, Moraga Country Club. Uh, this is just kind of another close up image of what a camera actually looks like. 
uh, with the, the custom arm that we have made uh, from a company in Reno that uh, bends the steel and welds them on for us. And that allows us to go through um, and provide that structural analysis of that mount to the, the different uh, agencies or tower companies that we'll be putting a camera on. Um, in Lafayette, uh, we've kind of been lucky to put them on most of the county owned towers. So the county maintains its own network of about eight towers within the county. Um, and we've put one to two cameras on all of those towers. Uh, and then we filled in the holes um, with some privately owned towers and then some publicly owned towers by different real estate companies that um, we've set up agreements with. Everybody's been really great to work with. Uh, they really see the benefit of the program. And then um, obviously, you know, when we do have an event, um, you know, we can go back and say, hey, you know, we were able to use your, your camera. This is uh, more just a, a picture of an install and I'll stop on this one. Uh, as we've touched on, the cameras do go to different dispatch centers. So in our area, the dispatch centers that would have access to actually move the cameras and zoom in on a fire would be our Contra Costa Fire Dispatch Center, uh, the local uh, Cal Fire Dispatch Center, the Sheriff's Dispatch Center, and uh, pg e the Weather Safety Operations Center. So between those four, as well as a few volunteers thrown in the mix there, um, like the chief said, uh, we can almost promise that within a minute or so of a fire being reported, there will be at least one, uh, most likely two or three cameras facing that fire to kind of give a size up of how big is the smoke column? Uh, is it in a residential area? What's it near? Um, and that's really how the, the program helps not only the boots on the ground, but also the dispatch centers to, to really give them eyes and be able to relay that information before uh, first responders get on scene. Um, and the, like the chief said, the image that's shown on the public webpage uh, is just a 10 second screenshot. So the public does not have the ability to move the cameras. Um, they're simply shown what the cameras are looking at uh, based on which operator is uh, controlling them. Uh, these are just two examples of the cameras kind of looking out. We have a camera up on Mount Diablo that was uh, installed by Cal OES. And then this Brioni's camera is one of our privately um, kind of uh, uh, private cameras on private property, but it, you can see the, how far out it actually looks. We're looking at the bay there in the top left corner. Uh, and that image right there just kind of shows that if there was a fire moving through the Brioni's Valley, we would have a, um, a pretty good idea of where it is and how fast it's moving. I'll go through this really quick, just to be quick on time. Um, why alert wildfire? What is the program for? Uh, reduce response time to wildfires and brush fires the ability to scale resources up or down, um, and Confire touched on that. Follow the fire behavior, so quite literally follow the fire, um, whether it's by using one camera or multiple to figure out exactly where it's going. Uh, critical information to first responders and the public, and that's kind of the key thing here is the reason Alert Wildfire has a public web page is to give residents an idea of, you know, where's the fire? Is it near my house? Should I start uh, preparing to evacuate? Uh, and then obviously after containment, provide a watchful eye on that mop up uh, just to make sure that the fire doesn't restart. Here's a perfect example, uh, something kind of close to home. This is the LNU Lightning Complex. This is the camera up on Mount Vaca. Uh, so between Cordelia and Vacaville Fairfield. Uh, and that is not zoomed in at all. That fire is about 20 to 30 feet away from the tower. Uh, and we watched that live at 11.55 p.m. last night, or, or not last night, last year, as the fire crested Mount Vaca and um, unfortunately went down the hill into the Vacaville uh, unincorporated Solano area. Um, and then this next image as well. This is kind of a well-known image. It was up on the public webpage for a while. Uh, this is the Bonnie Dune camera right above Boulder Creek in Santa Cruz. Uh, this camera and tower were completely destroyed by the fire. This is one of the last images from the camera uh, that was taken as a screenshot. Um, but again, having the camera quite literally in the fire gives uh, everybody an idea of how fast it's moving, how uh, hot it's burning, and where it's going. And you know, to have a camera destroyed by the fire is a small price to pay for being able to tell people, hey, it's time to evacuate. You know, it's here's where it is in real time. And this is just a quick video of, of what happened there.
And you can see the fire coming up on the tower and that's going to be the last image as the fire uh, burned up all the equipment at the bottom. Uh, we are working right now, uh, Alert Wildfire um, is working with pg e to incorporate the weather uh, station info into the Alert Wildfire webpage and vice versa. Uh, if you're not familiar with the pg e uh, weather uh, information page, just uh, simply do a quick Google search of pg e weather station. Uh, and this shows a near real-time uh, view of all their different weather stations. And uh, we'll use this. I'll have this pulled up side by side on my computer to show um, the wind speed. And then I'll have the camera right next to it. Uh, and a lot of these locations where they've installed weather stations, there is a camera uh, nearby. And that uh, helps a lot. Um, so I think that's going to be the end of my um, presentation part, Chief, unless you want to add anything else. We'll just wrap up on the cameras and turn back to council. Uh, this... These cameras are provided uh, through this program free of charge to our agency. Um, as PG mentioned, they are one of the sponsors of that program. So some of these cameras you'll see PG or some other entity, their logo on it, they are part of financing the cameras themselves. So the city of Lafayette essentially is paying for John's time. Uh, the connectivity that we had to provide to make this network, uh, all these cameras, or connected and all that data comes back to the police department and then goes out on the public facing uh, site through alert wildfire. So we're paying for that connectivity. Uh, that connectivity that John has developed through these various sites has been utilized. Uh, the internet from a, a, a camera location was used to give internet to the Hercules vaccination location because of that network that he developed. So there's other, there's a lot of other potential for the, the uh, this system to assist us in other emergencies because of, the internet and the connectivity John built within this very reliable system. So um, if we had to go out and do this out of our pocket, it'd be cost prohibitive, uh, but it is definitely a partnership with our, our partner agencies to get these things done. And then really just, it's a credit to these private landowners who allow John literally just, Hey, how are you? My name is John. Can I put a camera here? And, and so we've developed a lot of relationships uh, and, but I, I do appreciate the partnership we've had from our community to make something really great happen with this. And lastly, they are beta testing a new version of these cameras. Uh, John was gonna to touch on it, but I told him not to and said I'll do it. But um, that'll basically take that image that the camera sees and break it into micro grids and be able to say, hey, 10 sec seconds ago, I did not see smoke and now I do and send an alert to the fire dispatchers. And they haven't beta tested that in the North Bay so that uh, it can actually send alerts to fire dispatchers in the future. So uh, once that gets all ironed out, we definitely will be happy to upgrade our cameras in Contra Costa County. Mayor, thanks for your time listening to all the presentations. I'll turn it back to you. Oh, I, I just wanted just very quickly, thank you everybody who presented tonight and make sure from the city of Lafayette that you thank not only yourselves, but send on to all the men and women behind you doing a lot of this work. Make sure they all know that we appreciate them and thank them very much. Anyway, so I, I, I know people have questions. I have questions, but I'll let other people start. And, um, and other council members, if you have any questions, please uh, raise your hand. All right, Vice Mayor Geringer. Geringer. Although um, <laughs> Gina had had her question up at the very beginning, her hand up, so, so I can defer. I'll defer to Gina and then okay. I'll go next. Sounds great. Oh, thank you, Vice Mayor Gerinder. Um, again, I, I echo Mayor Kandel's words. Thank you so much for all um, you all are doing and your teams for being preventative and the work you did also um, the fire two years ago. Um, was something else. I know that was quick thinking and quick action that really saved um, the neighborhoods, frankly, who, who did have to evacuate. Um, I have a question, uh, actually, um, less PG&E, uh, based on that fire. Um, we did get the fire report from Con Fire, and I do know that um, both that fire report and PG&E mentioned it's the equipment that uh, touched off those fires, and I would hope that we can get more information on that so that if there's any other equipment that is so compromised that that uh, that's definitely being looked at. Uh, so we are once again proactive. Um, an electrical pole fell down. We would like to know why. Um, that would be an important thing. So if we can follow up with someone 
on your end, that would be great. Um, and it, would that be uh, something we can do with you or who can we be in touch with? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not aware of the details on that. So if I can get date, time, uh, location, I'm able to uh, generate a pg e report from that and get more details on cause uh, on our part. And I'll um, look at also look at the fire report working with uh, Chief McAllister or um, their Fire Prevention Bureau and uh, determine um, you know, what we can do in the future to prevent that in, uh, in that location. Just to say, though, that um, you know, our equipment on, on certain hot days especially um, is um, overtaxed and um, a lot of electricity goes through it and, and there are failures. And that's unfortunately just part of the system. Although, um, hopefully, with the vegetation management and things uh, along our right-of-ways, we're able um, to limit the damage, uh, uh, if necessary, to any of those locations. But, yes, absolutely, we'll I'll work on getting that if I can get those details from someone on council. Okay, that, that would be greatly appreciated. And, and just as follow-up to that, um, there are many transformers that um, – uh, different neighborhoods report blowing. Who who can we report that into at PG&E? That would be important to know too. The communication lines back up, so those um, not only do we know that they're reported, but that the neighbors um, can know how soon that might be, be um, followed up upon. So just some communication angles would be good to know in general. So typically, if we have a transformer um, blow, as, as you say, it causes an outage. If we have an outage, we get a trouble in there, and that's all documented. Uh, repairs are made, and, and then uh, customers are, are back in service. If for some reason we don't have an outage, and, and we, you may have some arcing that occurs, and there's no outage involved, um, and it would be good for us to know the address, the location. Um, so I would encourage the, uh, the citizens to call PG&E directly on that. Uh, mention the address and we'll send a troubleman out to investigate and um, make repairs or, or do whatever we need to, to keep that from happening again. Okay. Thank Can I add on there, Les? Yes, Mark. Uh, Councilmember Dawson, um, great question. Um, so as Les mentioned, it's really important for the customers to, to call our 1-800 number. And my suggestion to community members would be note the date, the time, and ask the person that you speak with for a ticket number. It should be a ticket or a work or you know, to, to initiate uh, an investigation or a look into whatever the problem is. But if there's a hazardous situation, the first thing somebody can press is number one. That's the first thing they'll go to. You know, if you have a hazardous situation, press one. Report that hazardous situation. And I just suggest tracking the date and the time. And certainly if they are coming to you, Council Member Dawson or, or uh, Mayor Candel or city manager, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> whoever, public works, that helps us track down when it was reported in the ticket. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brooks. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, I appreciate Mark, your, your, your instructions for us to uh, process a ticket associated with a, with a, I just want to make sure. What, what what is your title again, Mark? Sure. So I'm a public affairs representative for PG&E for Napa, Marin, and as I said, after the passing of our public affairs representative Tom Greeno, I am working to support Contra Costa County as well. Okay. My my community doesn't want to hear about you know instructions about processing ticket for for another failure of your utility agency that has just had a track record of monumental failures in our community and that throughout california for the last you know five to eight years and we also don't want to hear from mr putman about you know that's just how it is with infrastructure that's been you know that's failed over the years you've you've killed a lot of people um so the hubris that both of you i think you've just answered those two questions with is beyond beyond reproach. I think you've you know you're probably going to learn that this community is uh, is has very little confidence in your utility agency and has very little confidence in the PUC to over, oversee your agency. So perhaps next time when you come before us, you know you can you can come with a bit more of a bureaucratic answer than than you just provided, because I personally find it find it incredibly offensive that you would you would answer a question like that the way you did. 
I'm answering the way that our process works and well, council well, member. Your, uh, your, your process is broken. I will take that back to our, our leadership. It is uh, helpful to know how they, we can improve. I think, I think they know it's broken and I think the state does too. Um, may I just follow That's, up? Please. Um, Mark, uh, thank you. I think you're, I uh, would love to meet with you. I think um, all due respect to Tom, who was wonderful and we do miss him. Um, wonderful guy. So um, it would be great if we could talk because one of the things we were following up on was this communication. Um, so I'll be glad to hopefully set some time aside to meet with you. That would be great. We could follow Absolutely. Up. I, I welcome that um, under COVID conditions and as soon as possible, we'd love to meet with people in person as well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Vice Mayor Geringer. Um, so, first of all, echoing all of the thanks to um, everyone who um, presented information this evening and everyone who took out the time took the time to be here uh, to allow the community to hear all of this important information. We we know that you're working at this all the time and that you have our best interests um, from fire, police, water. Um, I don't want to forget anybody, Duncan. Thank you, you know, for all that you've done in terms of taking all of your experiences and putting it into that fabulous book. And I'm going to come down and get some um, chief to have sitting over here so that my neighbors all have access to that as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And the other piece is I did have several questions as we were going through, but they got answered in the presentations, and they were um, about. Um, we know there's the high level partnership, but the way that you're all working together, um, sharing the technology, the cameras, um, making sure that um, everybody has access to every agency. Um, and I know we can always, you know, be better. And um, it was very gratifying to hear. And of course, John Cornell is a rock star. And um, I want to thank John for his part in making sure that um, all of that communications um, is happening and that all of the technology. And so I do have a couple of questions and um, one of them, and I think um, Chief Bachman, you uh, touched on the weed abatement and that Sunday was the deadline in East County. And I would, I don't think I heard it, but can you confirm when the deadline for weed abatement before we start getting our visits is here in the La Miranda area and Lafayette in particular? So the notices um, <clears throat> should have went out with a, a date of May 27th. So roughly 10 days is when we'll be out, start doing, um, start to do those inspections in Central and in West County. And at the rate we're going at, at doing almost, you know, 50 a day and the number of inspectors we have associated with this will easily be done with our East County um, uh, residents that are on our list that we need to inspect and be able to focus on Central and West uh, in the next 10 days. So um, we can, you know, provide a report if the city wants to know, you know, after the first week, what kind of compliance we're, we're achieving. But uh, we're very pleased at what we saw on day one of 90% compliance on the, on the lots that we inspected in East County today. Great, thank you. And um, correct me, or I mean, confirm or correct me, this, these deadlines are earlier than they have been in previous years, correct? Correct. Usually it's more the beginning of June. A lot of times you'll see uh, in East County at, at maybe June 1st and um, June 7th to June 15th. But we're also, because of the drought that we're experiencing and the dry conditions, um, we're already seeing it with the fires that we've been on that we're experiencing fire behavior that we usually see in June and July. Um, we're already seeing that in May. So we know that the, the fuel moisture is already down, the, the conditions you know, are there and we need to encourage that you know, people don't wait any longer. The, one of the pictures that was showed um, during our slide presentation was actually um, in East County this year where it really did make a difference. And the, we went out and followed up with the homeowners and they said, you know, we just spent, we finished our abatement early, you know, two days ago. And they were just amazed at when they watched 
the fire come up the back of that, you know, open field. And luckily it didn't um, damage any homes, but it did take out multiple sheds and outbuildings. Those two homes that had done their abatement ahead of time received no property damage uh, to any structures or their home. So it really does make a difference and we're encouraging our residents to make sure that, that they're doing their um, abatement and working on defensible space um, now and not waiting till the deadline. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I think this is a question, but I might also save it, but I wanna come back similar, I mean, on the vein of the defensible space and um, vegetation management and weed abatement and all of that. Um, several, I don't know, months ago, maybe during the last fire season, I had um, asked us during um, our council member update about looking into um, the similar program and vegetation management that I know that um, Arinda has done, and I believe Moraga, I think Arinda's ordinance is stronger. And Dennis, maybe, um, maybe you would be the one to um, be able to speak to um, sort of where we are in Lafayette relative to um, having the I don't know if it's a hammer in place to be able to really have a stricter um, vegetation management and hardening. Um, to speak from the experiences MOFD um, has had in Moraga and Narinda. Sure, just real quick, and then I'll and I'll give Chief Bachman a chance to chime in on what's going on in Contra Costa. Um, I, I, in the sort of pre-meeting, there was a discussion about the. Uh, the MOFD's new fire code, and that was actually passed in October of last year and went into effect early in uh, 2021. So we're right now in the process of doing the same thing that Contra Costa County Fire is doing as far as ramping up our, our weed abatement inspections and making sure that everyone has the, has the message that it's super important this year to create their defensible space to prepare their properties for wildfire because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Um, and so um, being a small district, we were able to, to work with a number of different uh, stakeholders in the, in the new fire code and do some, some what I think are innovative things, but things that are also coming at a state level, um, such as require that there's no flammable vegetation within two feet of the structure foundation. Um, a number of cases we've seen where wildfires, if there are no suppression personnel or the homeowner's not there to to keep the fire from running right up to the house, it, the fires tend to creep through those low lying vegetation, the duff right next to the houses and somehow find a way into the structure. So um, uh, we did that. We did um, some other um, basically enhanced defensible space measures um, coming up. We're, we're going to in 2023, I believe, um, Juniper is gonna be a, not a permissible plant within the district for as far as landscaping. Um, those, those, that family of plants is super flammable and tends to burn with very high intensity. Um, and then the other thing that we've recently done, along with supporting our firewise communities in Moraga and Orinda, is um, established a, a uh, wildfire, um, I have to think of what the name is, uh, Fire Adapted Community Ambassador Program, where we actually have neighbors going and talking to their neighbors about what simple things they can do around their homes to, to uh, be ready for wildfire season when it gets there. And we have a little dashboard set up on our website. And so far we have, we have 23 uh, pilot program volunteers and they've done over a hundred sort of knocking on doors and saying, hey, I've got this checklist. Let's look around your property if you don't mind. So I think, you know, just to, to emphasize it, it some other people have said tonight, it really is a partnership and the partnership um, involves not only the agencies and the municipalities, the elected officials, but definitely the residents play a very important part of this. So with that, I don't know, Chris, do you have any, any things to add? It's, it's really just um, the approach we've chosen to take is to follow the state guidelines. And there are some new changes that are being proposed that um, should be coming out around the July 1st. Some of that um, is going to relate to, you know, the access roads, um, areas that have um, only one way in and one way out, um, new developments that um, if you're in a very high fire hazard severity zone, um, additional requirements um, on new developments. 
Uh, again, this is so it's in the open comment stage right now. And that goes until I believe June 14th. We're expecting uh, those new regulations then to, to follow the goal was um, at the state level that a lot of these um, guidelines would, would come out on July 1. So we're watching what those new regulations and any changes with defensible space and access um, come out to assess those and determine if, if there's a necessity to make changes moving forward. But the one thing we are doing um, um, that we're taking very seriously is, is tracking our statistics. And we can get you those for the number of fires that you had last year. It was provided in our presentation, but we're doing that for <laughs> not just Lafayette, but all of our communities of identifying how many fires did you have in your, in your city or in your, in, our, in your jurisdiction? And then what was the cause? How big did the fire get? How many apparatus did we have? It's on a spreadsheet that we're, we're providing um, to our municipalities. So you can see the number of resources that, was it just a single resource that was needed or did it require a full response where you got the helicopter, the bulldozer, you know, um, four, four type um, three engines, a type six, maybe did we do structure protection? You know, what was, what was there? And we do that so we can also evaluate where we have our resources, the pre-positioning and was that effective and, and did it really make a difference when we had that? Because those preposition um, days and those funds are coming from the state level, we wanna have the statistics behind it to show that if on those red flag events and we did preposition and we had fires that it really did make a difference in um, providing those extra, in upstaffing and, and providing mm -hmm. extra resources throughout our jurisdiction. Great, thank you very much. That's all for now, Mayor, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Marjorie. Yeah, a specific question. Um, it just seems that there's a lot more tree die off this year than in previous years. There's a lot of uh, dead Monterey pines here in the Release Valley area specifically, um, and then north of us in the county. Whose responsibility is that uh, to uh, mitigate uh, the, the risk from all these uh, dead trees? Well, that responsibility would be the homeowner, but we do not have the enforcement mechanism to mandate that they must take the, the tree down. The issue, once the tree falls, that's where um, we have that enforcement mechanism that can kick in that um, when additional vegetation is at ground level, then that's when it falls under our weed abatement standard and we can address the removal of those fuels because we know that it's the lateral fuel, ladder fuels as they're on the ground is what causes them to approach your, your higher you know, fuels and get up into the trees, which then gets into your, into your homes. Okay, uh, just to follow up, Chief Aldred, is there anything in our code that would allow our code enforcement officer to do anything about that? Not that I'm aware of, but I'll be happy to follow up on that tomorrow. Um, not that I'm aware of, but I can follow up on that. Okay, and then of course the same is true throughout the county along Pleasant Hill Road. There's just a lot of uh, uh, dead pine trees now. It, it, it just doesn't look good, but more important, it appears to be a, a fire danger. Um, a, a bigger picture question, we've talked mainly about what's going on or what we should be doing within the Lafayette city limits. Could you give us a picture and this, um, of, of what's going on in the county uh, that might provide protection for Lafayette? For example, are there fire breaks? Are there, is there vegetation management in addition to the weed abatement that we should be aware of? Are there programs that should be underway that we should be lobbying the state uh, to put into place? You know, what, what, should, what, could be, what could we be doing to be uh, safer aside from what we do within the city limits? The big one is uh, making sure that the, a lot of it's been covered in this presentation, that the homeowners um, need to be just as involved as all your public safety um, agencies um, are, that the presentations we've given. Um, but a lot of that is, you know, the preparedness, uh, whether it's that they are ready to go, they're signed up for the alerting systems to know when it's time to go, including that they have provided that defensible space um, at their home 
Um, so if a fire does come up to the back of their property or is approaching their home, that it's allowing us, we'll say, a fighting chance to protect that home and try and stop the fire as it approaches their property line or approaches their property. The areas that, um, that, that kind of let their, their landscaping and their property maintenance, I mean, they don't address it you know, in a timely manner, they don't um, address it properly. Those are the ones that are harder, harder to protect. And we talk about, you know, the ladder fuels and, you know, trimming up your trees. So if there is um, a fire coming up a slope or across the ground, that it's not getting up into the canopy or it's not getting up in the trees to create that big ember cast. Because it's not just the, the, um, the ignition from a tree to a house, it's also the ember cast that we have to be worried about. So ideally, if we can keep the fire on the ground out of the, the canopies, it's, it's really gonna eliminate the ember cast that we have that can you know, start a fire up to a mile away when these fires really get you know, moving through the, um, through the forest. Eric, which which includes, you know, the, yeah, sure. So, we have communicated with uh, Chief Winnaker of Moraga Rinda, and the state has put a ton of money into um, mitigation projects. There's a lot of money in the bucket, but we have to access that money, and that's through an application process. It's a competitive process, and we are collaborating with Moraga Rinda on a regional grant that would increase and add to some of the fuel breaks that have already been put in place. These projects take a tremendous amount of time and effort, um, whether it's an analyst, um, someone with a scientific background, like a forester to look at these projects, and then to get CEQA clearance on these projects. They're, they're time intensive. Uh, there is a bill moving through the legislature this year that would eliminate some of the CEQA requirements for some of these fuel mitigation projects. Uh, in our mind, that, that streamlines things and makes it easier to protect communities and makes make things safer. At a local level, the fire chiefs have met and uh, proposed some things that will be going in front of the Major X Committee. And part of that involves fuel mitigation projects, funding those positions that help us get those projects to the finish line and actually get boots on the ground, uh, cutting fuel and making things safer in the community. So that's definitely on our radar at the uh, executive fire chief level, and that'll be going in front of Major X, I think this week. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, Vice Mayor Geringer. Just to follow up, Chief McAllister, um, I know we could find this by Googling it, but do you have the bill number um, on the CEQA streamlining for fire breaks and mitigation? Not off the top of my head, but I can get it. Okay, that. we have somebody who I bet can find it for us. I bet. Thank you. All right, great. So. Um, I'll go on, I do have some questions. Um, so yes to chief, we do want those compliance reports for Lafayette, thank you. And there was also, you were talking about the new state requirements that are now in the comment period, which is the agency that is reviewing that and getting the comments. You don't have to tell me now, please send it to us so we can also review and put in our comments because I was unaware that those were being asked for at the moment. Um, so the, uh, the fire hydrant question. I know we have areas that are in Lafayette that are far from hydrants. Do we ever add, expect to add more or what, how do you respond to somebody saying we're a mile away? I mean, are all of the houses in our city covered? I guess it goes to Chief Bachman or McAllister. I'll start. So this issue comes up on a case by case basis when we get a land use development application. Uh, a lot of times a property that is vacant may have a difficult time meeting the fire flow requirements, um, but ultimately the number of hydrants, the location of those requirements, uh, it's kind of a two prong approach. It's either up to the water purveyor to provide that, or it's up to the landowner uh, if they want to increase their service for that specific address to basically purchase that upgrade in order to meet some other requirements. So it, it does get looked at from our office uh, during the, the land use and development phase. Okay, so it sounds like uh, it's an East Bay mud question, a landowner and an East Bay mud question. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so PG&E, um, 
you guys talked about all the um, power lines, but there we have a lot of gas pipelines, especially in the East Bay Regional Park District. Are you doing wildfire safety and vegetation um, management around the pipelines as well? Les, do you want to take that? Or I have a comment, but I don't know if you have more to add. I can, I can take that initially if you want to add, that's fine. Um, so the answer to that, short answer to that is yes, we are doing uh, vegetation management in and around our pipelines as well. It's part of our community pipeline safety initiative that um, we started several years ago. Uh, and, and actually we have quite a, um, a history with Lafayette in, in dealing with that. But uh, the goal is to remove trees that might endanger the uh, pipeline uh, itself. Um, and so, yes, those trees are being mitigated um, as, as well in all of our areas. What about uh, vegetation, uh, not just the trees, the grasses and do you, who does that around those? So typically the uh, vege lower vegetation is not mitigated because uh, that's not a hazard to the pipeline itself because of the shallow root system. However, um, uh, I'd have to actually check with our vegetation teams to find out if that's something that we currently are doing uh, in the event that uh, the gas uh, line has a situation that may cause a fire. Um, but not to my knowledge at this point, but I can get back to you on that. Okay. Claire, Kendall, can I, can I interject yes. really quick on that? Please. Um, so, um, Les, you're right. We do have a long history of pipelines. Um, just want to make sure we're clear. There are spans in Briones that the residents have pointed out were threatened by trees that overhung those spans. And I know, um, actually, Chief McAllister, that might have been you that weighed in on that. Um, so that was pointed um, out by residents and I know have been mitigated since. Um, there are still things that the community is concerned about. That would be leaks in um, any kind of reported gas leaks in high fire zones. We don't have, there's still a lot of things we can do working with PG&E. The CPSI program, um, was an issue because we didn't think it was addressing really the safety, um, the, the top priority safety risks in Lafayette. So just want to make that sure that's clear to the community um, why we have a history there. So we're-, we're oh, Absolutely. If I, yeah. And I don't mean, did not mean to imply it was a bad history. It, it's a, I'm hoping a co cooperative history that we're working together to make the area safe. Yes, exactly. Co working together, it is always better. And, and uh, we appreciate the work and look forward to more. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mayor, if I could just follow up on that as well. Yes, please. Um, I'll just tell you, it's, it's my practice. It has been in the other counties that I work in, the jurisdictions there. I make it no different, my practice uh, in Contra Costa. And, you know, if there, if there are issues of concern for the council, typically uh, I would work with, uh, through the city manager, uh, Manager Srivatsa, has my contact information. I'm available daily uh, for a phone call. Uh, I was mentioning the process to start a ticket because it is the way that we capture and sort of start the, the timeline. So I didn't want to. I didn't mean to say that, make that sound as if, uh, well, you know, you just go take care of this and and you know brush it aside. If there are certain issues for Council Member Dawson or other Council members, if I can start getting a list or tracking that. I'll make every effort to follow up with less and, and continue mitigating those issues. Okay, great. We'll be in contact. Um, so this is actually more for East Bay Mud, I guess. Um, the, you guys share a lot of land or are adjacent to East Bay Regional Park District land. I know they're not here, but um, how would you characterize your tiered approach to your wildfire mitigation? to what is happening on the East Bay Regional Park lands. It doesn't seem like they are doing nearly as much mitigation as East Bay mud is. And I just wanna see what your comments are about that. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, we have a, a positive working relationship with uh, East Bay Regional Park District, particularly where we have adjoining properties and there are opportunities for us to collaborate on uh, fuel management in those areas. And there's, you know, it's mutually beneficial to each agency. There's some uh, economies there. 
um, and it makes for a, a better finished product as well because there's continuity in whatever treatment is being applied. Uh, and, and often that is, uh, as we know, fire doesn't really know any boundary. And so if usually the prescription for that area, for an area like that where there are adjacencies, it, it applies equally as well to both sides. And so, like I said, I think the end result is definitely better when there's collaboration. And we do have a good working relationship with them. Um, I mean, and I, I can point to examples of that. Also, I think, you know, a really good example of where we've worked successfully together with them is along Grizzly Peak Boulevard up in the Oakland Berkeley interface area. Okay. Um, so I, I think, you know, my answer to your question would be, I think, I think we do have a, a, a positive working relationship with them and uh, that, that they are doing quite a bit on their property. Okay. All right. Because there's a lot of homeowners where we live that, that do butt up against um, park district lands and they're not maintaining their their barriers. Right. And I guess if I need a fire wise, they're supposed to maintain all the periphery. Right. And and I don't I don't believe that they are. And I just wondering if that was true for any of your lands as well. Yeah, and I can't speak, you know, there, there may be some areas that I'm not aware of uh, that you're referring to, particularly maybe in the Akalani's Ridge area. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm more familiar with the work that they do uh, in the Oakland Berkeley interface area where okay. we abut properties. Okay, all right. Thank you. I think those you're were, welcome. yeah, those were my questions. Uh, so. Mary Kandel, uh, yes. Brett Kalakami yeah. with East Bay Mud. So I, I just wanted to respond to your earlier question on fire hydrants. I, I apologize, I couldn't get off mm. mute. <laughs> fast enough, but I don't know the particulars, but you know, I'll, I will check in with our planning department and um, provide some information that may be useful to help answer that question. Thank you very much. All right, Council Member Burks. Yeah, I just had a question. Um, and I maybe I missed this in the beginning that the, the purpose of this actual meeting here, we've lost half of our participants in the last 20 minutes. Um, you know, yeah, is this was this meant to be a a forum, and I thought it was when we talked about our last council meeting for to benefit the people of our city in preparing for wildfire season, or was it was it meant to be what we've turned it into in kind of a, a part and parcel policy discussion? It's been a little bit, a little bit. I know scattered, it's been a which, which has been great questions, but I mean, how much have we benefited the city here, and should we should we just move to public comment? And like, I think so too. Yes, or, yes, please. Okay. No, no disrespect to anybody. I just, I mean, I'm seeing people drop off here and. People are nervous about what's happening here. And that's why I suggested maybe a town hall, the veterans, you know, I know we can't get together right, right now, but uh, anyways, just, just my two cents. All right, thank you. All right, so with that, let's adjourn to public comment. All right, well, we don't have any hands raised right now. So we'll give folks a second to use the raise hand function if they do have public comment or star nine if you're on the telephone. So having said that, we do have a couple of people. And first up is Dave Don Darrow. Okay, Dave, you're in the meeting, so go ahead. Sorry, it took me a second to get off mute. I apologize. Um, my question is specifically about St. Mary's, the stretch from the ball fields up to uh, like the Los Trampas pool area. There's a pretty wide swath of land there um, on both sides of St. Mary's as it goes through that S curve. Don't know whether it's city land or county land. Um, I've talked to a bunch of neighbors, some of whom have done their own fire remediation like up in uh, the canyons. And they are, as, as am I, because I live right near it, are very concerned about that corridor. Um, it doesn't seem to ever get uh, addressed in terms of, of weed abatement or uh, the 12 foot ladder fuel issue. Um, and a lot of us have, have talked about um, how, uh, we kind of envision in a, in a fire that that would be one of those paradise-like fire tunnels. Um, and it's one of the few place, uh, ways to get out of Burton Valley. So I was wondering, um, how, how do we address that? Um, go ahead. 
Uh, uh, it's Chris Bachman. I'll go ahead and, and answer that. So the I, I just jotted down a, a note that I will uh, follow up on on that section. So we need to look up and see who the property owner is. Have they ever been given um, a notice? Was is it on our our list that's been addressed in the past? And if it's not, then first we need to identify the property owner to. Um, you know, notify them of the concern and see if they can take care of the abatement. If it's um, a parcel that's, we'll say, isn't owned by anybody or it's unclaimed or it's a, a vacant parcel, we do have parcels around uh, the county that um, kind of for all intents and purposes are kind of abandoned, that uh, whoever technically owns them isn't paying property tax on it. Uh, the county will not let us uh, um, do a, a work order and put a lien on it. In that case, then we do one of two things. We would either um, still hire our contractor to abate the property and then we just eat that cost. Um, or the other one is if it's kind of in a public right of way and if it's in an area that um, could have an impact on egress, we could evaluate it and see um, is it an area that we could have our, our crew 12 um, address that in an abatement early in the morning as kind of a training piece. So I think there's multiple options, but the first step is we need to see who is the property owner um, that on the parcel we're talking about. And if, um, if we could start by just sending me um, an email and I'll get it over to our CRR uh, folks or actually to one of our clerks that researches those properties. My email is cbach, C-B-A-C-H at cccfpd.org. And we'll start there with, um, let's, let's find out who owns uh, the parcel, but if you could give me the details on that, then it'll help us as we um, research it. But the first step we need to do is find out who the owner is and provide them the proper notification so they have the appropriate time frame to do the abatement before we start taking those enforcement actions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and uh, reach out to you via email. I, I I am one of the property owners, but I do not I I mitigate down to my property line. And the problem is there's a there's a swath of land that was taken by the county decades ago for purposes of straightening out St. Mary's, but they never did it. So I believe that is either county or city owned land, um, and I I think that's the issue is that. Um, there are no property owners to, to do abatement because it's it's not private property. Okay. Hey, Mayor, I would just offer if we have any other similar uh, comments from the public about a question about property, uh, they can either uh, email uh, the county fire or if they can't remember the email address, they could always email cityhall at lovelafayette.org. If they're having a question on a specific piece of property and with city staff and or with uh, Chief Bachman, we can figure out those answers that way they get the follow-up. So for anyone listening, feel free to do that. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I, I know I, we got questions last year about uh, Moraga Road out to Camp Alindo High School. Same kind of questions, same overgrown on that entire roadway question. So we can add that to the list and send them all on. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, up next we have Gabriel Newman joining the meeting now. Hi everyone, um, having a good evening here, I hope. Um, my name is Gabe Newman. I live off of Carroll Lane near to the downtown quarter here in Lafayette. Um, I just had a couple of quick questions in particular for Chief Bachman. Um, as you know, I think the, the city is currently in the early stages of working on its housing element as part of the general plan update in the sixth housing cycle. Uh, a number of residents in Lafayette, especially those who live outside of the downtown corridor have expressed serious concerns over their ability to evacuate in a timely and safe manner. Many of these residents are concerned because there's often only one way in and one way out of their neighborhoods. Um, so as we consider where to encourage development of multifamily housing in our city, I wanna be sure that we're considering fire safety and following the best information available. Uh, so I've reached out to Cal Fire in the past and I've heard that codes for fire have changed since the 2000s and that structures built after that time make neighborhoods safer uh, through better building practices that meet 
or exceed code and do a better job of resisting embers, heat, and direct flame. Um, I wanted to ask, how comprehensively do you think wildfire section uh, of an environmental impact report explores the risks posed by new development? And, and do you think the mitigation recommendations are typically effective? Um, additionally, could you speak a little bit to uh, already existing research and data on evacuation times in neighborhoods of the city that only have one way in or out given current infrastructure? Uh, thanks so much, really appreciate it. So when we're, when we're providing um, comments, that's always at the, what you're, to the piece you're speaking of is always in the, the planning level um, that it's going to. And what we keep our comments to is what the requirements are based on, on the current fire code. So when it talks about, you know, water supply, when it talks about road width, when it talks about, let's say, um, a large development, when, when it exceeds 100 units, then another piece um, kicks in, which is actually a local ordinance that that we say you must now provide two ways um, in and out of this uh, project. So these are all requirements that are addressed in the planning stage, and we are limited in what we can and what we provide comment to. That everything's based not on opinion, but based on code requirements, and it's based on currently we're in the 2019 California Fire Code with our um, local amendments, and one of those amendments is when you have a large uh, multifamily uh, project or residential project of, of single family dwellings. When you um, exceed that 100 units, um, residential units is when, when it kicks in to say um, even more restrictive than the California Fire Code that, that you must now provide two ways in and out of that complex or that, that subdivision or that project. But when it goes before planning, it's, it's the, if you're talking about economic or I'm sorry, environmental impact. Um, our job is to really just stick to what the fire code identifies as it's either legal to do or it's not legal or I should say compliant with the adopted code. So that's how we base all of our comments. And even with that, we will even reference what that, com that, um, that section is because the developer or the, the architect that's, proposed, that's, that's working on the project then has to go back and see, is there a way that they can, can meet that? And then if not, is there, is there other options? And you know, we identify and say, well, these are requirements. And as far as you know, when they say that there's, there's new requirements out there or it's safer, what they're referring to is type 7A construction. And 7A construction goes into the home hardening and the vegetation management plan that's required. I do wanna clarify though, that is only, those requirements only fall into the very high fire hazard severity zone areas. That if you're in a moderate or just a high, the, the 7A construction is not mandatory. We always recommend it, but it's not, um, a, a, man, it's not a mandated requirement of 7A construction and vegetation management plan. The, the maps are gonna be updated um, probably within the next year. And we've been warned that that's probably going to expand to a larger area. And when that happens, you'll probably, we'll start to see more of the 7A construction and the vegetation management plans being a requirement when they're applying for, for their building permits. Any other questions? Very good. Joining the meeting now is David. Go ahead, David, you're in. All right, David, you're on. Okay, how about this? Is it working? Yes. Yep. Okay, good evening. My name is David Schaefer, I'm a resident in Lafayette live near Trader Joe's. First, thank you, Mayor Candell and everyone for having this meeting tonight. I'm in the, the risk management and insurance business. And I think one of the things that we're, we haven't mentioned strongly is the most important reason to have this meeting is to save human lives one day. We have a wildfire event in our community. Uh, like we saw what happened in Paradise and other areas where human lives are lost. And we can prevent that by working together to prevent that by preventing fire. So we have to focus on 
loss prevention. Um, I, I, my question is for tonight is I love to, to walk the Lafayette Reservoir and I'm always wondering about the fire risk in the reservoir and how it could spread to the rest of the city and to Orinda Moraga. So I don't know if, if Brett or Scott or Aaron or Chris could address the fire risks that we currently have around the reservoir as we see it turn brown as we go up to the top and what, it, what is being done to mitigate the risk at the reservoir um, at this time. Thank you. So this is Chief McAllister, Confire. I'll throw in my two cents just from a policy perspective. Uh, many of the land management agencies have adopted a practice uh, such as Mount Diablo State Park of closing their parks to public access during red flag fire events. And I would strongly encourage all other publicly accessed land management uh, agencies to adopt the same philosophy that they should really be closed to the public on red flag events. Um, resources are precious. Uh, helicopters are needed to fight fire, not necessarily perform rescue. So if we can remove that human element from those spaces, it eliminates the opportunity for a fire to start. And then it, it eliminates uh, the demand for our resources to have to do rescues instead of fight fire. That would be our recommendation. Okay, very good, thanks for that. Coming up next is Michael Marchetti. Michael, you're in the meeting right now. Um, excuse me, this is Scott from East Bay Mud. Is it too late for me to respond to the question regarding um, no, if, fire if mitigation make, at Lafayette Reservoir? Make, make it quick, thank you, yes. Okay. Um, I, I agree with uh, Chief McAllister and we do have a process in place for closing down the reservoir. And actually we did that a couple of times last year, as I mentioned during our presentation that we monitor the fire danger calculations on a daily basis. And we implement restrictions up to including closures of the recreation area, depending on the severity of the fire weather. So that is something that we actively do and have done for a long time. But specifically to the caller's concern, there are a number of uh, fuel hazard reduction techniques that we put into play every year at Lafayette Reservoir, include up along the rim trail, including the disking adjacent to the rim trail, the mowing in certain areas to reduce the fuel load, grading of the fire road, uh, herded ghosts to reduce the annual grassland and, and the brush encroachment, um, and then mowing around the paved trail and also on the face of the dam. So there are several diff different techniques that uh, we implement each year to manage the fuel load within the reservoir. Thank you. All right, Michael, you're on. All right, thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, getting the chance to speak to y'all. Um, I'm a professor of ecology up at St. Mary's College and um, I live over in Burton Valley here. And in my driving around and seeing things, particularly in Burton Valley, we see a lot of homes that are right up against serious vegetation. And um, in the case of a fire, that even if they put a defensible space around their houses, I'm not sure that much is gonna survive that. And I'm just worried, right? Um, I look at this with a, with an interested eye, and I'm not sure what we're doing as a city to solve some of these problems, right? Um, the other thing that I'd like to see us do is there are some, some municipalities, particularly on that I'm aware of on the peninsula, like Woodside, where before fire season happens, they have vegetation programs in place where homeowners can remove vegetation themselves and then the city will pick up the vegetation and remove it. And I would like to see something like that go on in our town. Um, is there any possibility of that sort of thing? Sure, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with that because that's that's something that we're, is actually in the works right now that we're working uh, with the city of Lafayette. It'll be a partnership with um, Country House County uh, fire with Cal Fire, um, Lafayette PD, and uh, the City Public Works that we have um, uh, been able to secure the uh, wood chipper from Cal Fire 
Um, our crew 12 is going to assist with um, the labor that's needed to help feed the cheap chipper and, you know, get all the, the debris cleaned up and um, coordinating with uh, Lafayette PD on, we'll say, marketing, selecting the days and getting the information out to the communities. Similar to um, MOFD, we are going to put um, a priority or an emphasis on serving the FireWise communities first and then um, moving into the other areas. It won't be a, uh, it will be a scenario where there'll be known or selected drop points that they're gonna have to take the vegetation to for us to chip it. Um, but we're working on getting those dates, getting those um, known locations out, but we're gonna start with our FireWise communities first and then um, um, pick select areas um, across the city. Uh, the city of Lafayette has, um, agreed to a certain dollar amount to help with the, ch the chip cleanup. We've been warned by Cal Fire that, you know, this is a great program. They're happy to, to partner with us and help, but we need to make sure that we do something with the chips. And majority of the time, um, the homeowners don't want the chips on their property. When you take it to a certain location, then, you know, the chips pile up. So we need to plan for the chip removal and the city has committed to helping us uh, do that. So we're looking forward to that partnership and a new um, program that we're going to offer in Lafayette this year and more to come very soon as I continue to work with this uh, Lafayette Police Department uh, to market this program and get some select dates out there. All right, very good. Coming up now is Steve Mirabito. I hope I pronounced that properly, but uh, Steve will tell us because he's joining the meeting right now. There you go. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council. This is a real timely meeting. And um, I've got two quick questions. Number one, along major arterials or exit routes out of um, uh, neighborhoods, in, especially in the very high fire area zones, um, there's a lot of canopy trees surrounding the entire road, all 180 degrees. Um, and Cal Fire recommends there's a 10 foot tree clearance on routes like that. Do you see that as a fire trap and an issue? And what are we gonna do about it? I'm looking at maybe Happy Valley Road I was on yesterday, uh, Rally's Valley I live off from today. Um, and then the second question is, you know, when do we get to a point where there's just way, you know, when the, there's enough trees in an area, what's our, like the fuel load in the Rellies Valley today compared to 50 years ago. Or is it higher? Is it lower? Is it the same? Do we have the same fire dangers today than we did 50 years ago? It just seems, you know, just curious about that. So thank you. It's hard for me to speak to, you know, the comparing, you know, something 50 years ago, we're really focusing our efforts right now on tracking it from year to year and what are our causes, what are our losses and what are we, um, uh, what's our success rate, what are we keeping it to? The, the piece as far as, you know, the, you know, is it important? Absolutely it is. And that's part of the defensible space um, program and identification of, it's the property owner's responsibility um, where those trees set to keep that canopy, um, to, not, not to eliminate the canopy, but to keep the clearance and that 10 foot clearance is so we can effectively drive our apparatus um, through there without, without any concern or without hitting anything. And that's why there, you know, you ask for the, the 10 foot clearance. The idea of the defensible space is, is limbing up the trees in hopes that we don't have that, that, um, spread from the ground on up to the ladder fuels to get into the canopies. And so it isn't, it isn't just the, the piece of, well, let's make sure our, our, um, we have our 10 foot clearance. It's also making sure that we have our trees limbed up to, pro to help prevent it from getting into those canopies to create the ember cast, which is going to, of course, spread the fire more rapidly or, or um, broaden the area. So, Sorry, I couldn't answer your question about the the fifty year comparison, but we are comparing data on an annual basis. We're happy to pro to provide that 
information and we had a very successful um, uh, last two years in the in the city of Lafayette with our only we'll say structure loss being uh, the tennis club on what we'll call a red flag warning day. Okay, Mayor Candell, I'm happy to note that our final speaker of the evening is Jeremy Levine, who's joining us right now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. I'm glad to be the finale, and it, it will be grand, I promise. Um, I really appreciate all of you taking so much time out of your evenings to talk to us. Fire safety is a really big concern in this community, and we are lucky to have so many talented professionals taking care of us. Um, I uh, This question might be particularly um, relevant for Chiefs McAllister and Rain. Um, what studies have been done, um, what studies are ongoing, and, and what would you like to see more broadly studied regarding uh, fire risk in Lafayette? Oh, so I'll jump in on that real quick and then I'll hand it off to you. And then I, I have a second question, but I'll, uh, I'd be interested to hear that answer, answer to that first. Okay. Um, there, there have been a, a number of studies that are looking at fire, fire risk, uh, fuel break effectiveness, um, um, you know, fire spread. Um, um, but, but the data, you know, is only as good as what happened last year. You know, as Chief McAllister said earlier, you know, we are, we are in record breaking times. Um, the, the Creek fire that happened last August, um, uh, just east of Fresno, it was one single ignition that burned 387,000 acres, the largest signal ignition fire in the, in the history of the state, burned through um, uh, an area in the Sierra National Forest over the Sierra Crest and was, you know, was a cause of concern for people that lived in Mammoth Lakes. The Million Acre Fire, the August Complex, and that was five counties worth of fire. When we saw from La Mirinda, we saw the, 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 the uh, Santa Clara complex that was lightning caused. So, you know, there's, there's really, there's no boundaries right now. And I think what we're doing, is, what we're seeing is we're, we're looking at the impacts of a hundred years of, of successfully putting out fires. Our forest health is degraded. You know, we've, we've encroached into what was traditionally open space. If you look at historical photographs of especially La Mirinda, you know, this was all grassland, grazing land, dairy farms, you know, and, and some orchards. So we're, we're you know, in a situation where um, the studies that we're doing that, you know, I work with a number of students um, that are doing those kinds of things, PhD candidate at UC Berkeley that's studying fuel break effectiveness. Um, but again, you know, my, my take on it is that the, the studies that are being done, they're looking at sort of a snapshot. And I think the fire activity is progressing at such a rate as we really don't know what's coming. Um, you know, the alarm that was at the beginning of this meeting that we're entering and again, a potentially unprecedented fire season You know, everybody that's listening, you know, you should take this, take that to heart and look at what you can do now before that ignition starts to prepare for wildfire. Um, we don't know where those are going to start. We don't know what under what conditions are going to burn, but certainly the, you know, the last five or 10 years in California, um, it, it we better wake up and we better start doing things now. Uh, Aaron, any so do, do, do you mind? Do you mind if I ask two? Well, I, I had one question I already wanted to ask, but now I have a follow-up. I just want to remind you, Jeremy, you have three minutes total, and uh, Joanne is timing you, so make it quick. Okay. Uh, well, I'll just ask these two questions then, and, and uh, make it out of the way. Um, I am curious. What, if any, do you think there are parts of Lafayette that may be less vulnerable that, that we need to worry less about so we can focus our resources on other areas? Or do you think it's like the whole city is particularly at risk? And then also, do you think that particularly in the downtown corridor where the most people are located, um, what what can the city do that it might not already be doing, or what can the fire district do that it's not already doing to ensure that that people are safe? 
So I'll add on to what, uh, what Dennis mentioned earlier. A couple of things we could look at specific to Lafayette. We need to work on getting our, our wildfire preparedness packages. Um, the, the fuel mitigation projects need to get packaged up and prioritized. That would be part of our community wildfire protection plan, the CWPP, where we kind of outline all of those different projects and get them to a shovel ready state so that when funding does become available, we can execute those projects. The other thing we can focus on, uh, we have a little more control over locally is evacuation routes. We can work with our city partners, our county roads partners, and we can put a focus and priority on evacuation routes and clearing those uh, dead limbs, dead trees, overhanging branches, and removing that from our evacuation routes. A couple of things we could do fairly easy uh, that would make a difference in our communities. Uh, lastly, in terms of the roadmap to risk, I would look at the CAL FIRE adopted wildland hazard severity maps and use those as a guide to uh, what the priorities are. It's already done for us. All right, and I'm sorry to steal Jeremy's thunder, but we have one final speaker and it's Michelle Carson. She's coming in the meeting right now. All right, Michelle, you're up and you're last and the last speaker. So please go ahead and unmute. All right, last call for Michelle Carson. All right, Mayor Candell, back to you. Great, thank you, um, and thank you all. Um, so Chief McAllister, that was a really interesting um, bit at the end to prioritize and bundle to get ready, get shovel ready projects. That is something it sounds like the city of Lafayette can work directly with you to get you know, maybe more items on your list. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, certainly there's room for that, yeah. Okay, I, that, that seems like a really good idea. It sounds like, I think we have a lot of things that we could probably get shovel ready in terms of projects um, if we put our efforts towards it. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody else have any other questions or comments? All right. Oh, well, okay, here comes two. <laughs> they were simultaneous. All right, uh, Council Member Dawson. Hi, I know it's very late, so I'm just gonna make this quick. Um, once again, I wanna thank you all, but um, I was wondering about the redundant systems for communications. I know um, uh, it sounds like um, Chief Aldrit, we have our own cell tower. Is that what I heard that John mentioned? How does that play into um, really in general over the community, the telecom companies making sure that there's access for a certain amount of time if there's power goes out. Yeah, our the mobile cell phone tower we have is, is completely independent of your overall uh, communications with your cell, cell phone companies. The idea with that is if we uh, had to set up a, a command center, you'd find command and or evacuation center where we needed to bring in cell reception for those folks within a a parking lot, uh, a school site, we could do that uh, with that emergency equipment. Um, I'd be happy, uh, I believe John's already logged off for the night. Chief, I, know, I can touch on that real quick. Oh yeah, there he is. John okay. does stay in touch with all of our, our cell companies locally, so John, go ahead. Yeah, um, so just two, two real quick points on that. Um, obviously with companies like Comcast, Wave, AT&T, uh, they all have their own uh, backup power solutions. Uh, they're not going to cover 100% of the citizens, and they're getting better at that. The cell phone companies uh, do have backup power on site for their towers. The one thing that they do rely on, which we saw in the fire in 2019 by the tennis club, uh, was the fiber optic cabling that goes up to them. And if that gets burned or cut, that tower, even if it has power, is essentially uh, dead. Um, so the, the companies are relying on power and they're relying on communication. PG&E has done a great job to, to reach out. And I know even last year, 
Um, you know, one thing I will say is less worked with me uh, and they do reach out and they'll provide power. Just one example is Moraga Police Department relies on Comcast for their main internet connection. Uh, and pg &E was able to, to reach out to Comcast and say, hey, this circuit's gonna be down. You need to find an alternate way to power that, that node or that little tiny section of, of Comcast line to make sure that Moraga um, was able to still connect with Lafayette and Arinda. And on top of that, one of the things going back to what Chief Aldrich said with the alert wildfire program is we are now able to provide a wireless microwave backup to uh, the Moraga Police Department, the La um, Arinda Police Department. We are also providing a connection to the Confire Dispatch Center. Uh, and we can take that connection and kind of beam it to wherever we might need it. And that could be an evacuation center. It could be the community center. Um, it could be one of the high schools and essentially bring in high speed internet access for people to use, um, you know, on an open Wi-Fi network, if you will, uh, for communication out. You know, it's not for YouTube. It's not for streaming, but just the basics of I'm OK. Here's where I am. Um, and that's separate from all of the cell phone companies, the Comcasts, the Waves. Um, that's just one of the things that the Lafayette Police Department has done to try to prepare. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that. And, and Les, um, then are you, it sounds like you're working proactively with the, tel the telecom companies um, to make sure that they, they do have kind of a, a heads up when there are planned PSPS? Yes, that, that's that's accurate. We not only work with the telecommunication companies, but the water districts as well. So uh, any support that that uh, these critical infrastructure agencies need, uh, especially during a PSPS event, we're um, we're trying to supply them with with their needs, generators, um, and um, and those types of things. Great, thank you. All right, Councilman Mandari. Yeah, just a quick follow up to Chief McAllister's last comment. When you were referring to shovel-ready projects, were you referring primarily to projects outside the Lafayette city limits like the fire break project? Or are there projects within the city limits we should be thinking about? So <clears throat> one example is the St. Mary's Road corridor that came up. So doing the work ahead of time to identify the landowners, obtain permission, uh, document that, is important to get those things ready before we go out there and start actually cutting vegetation. Same concept outside the city. If we look at Hunsaker Canyon and we we propose a project there, all that work has to be done on the front end. So so there's a lot of possibilities there. Great. Any other comments? All right. Thank you. Um, I do I do want to acknowledge Cam's. Uh, issue about how maybe we the public didn't get as much time as they needed we will we'll consider that and we may ask you guys back for a, just a town hall you know just plain questions start right out the shoot kind of thing and see we'll all see what the council thinks about that and hope you guys can be accommodating in order to get uh, more people involved in a in a meeting like this but otherwise i absolutely once again oh chief ben just on that note i'd like to add in um all the agencies represented here tonight, and I can speak more specifically to Law and Fire. Um, Confire has a great website with a lot of information. Um, and so one of the things we're gonna be doing over the next month and we'll do with our other partners on tonight is um, sometimes local residents just go to the city of Lafayette or just to one entity looking for that information. And so uh, what I would encourage is all the agencies represented here tonight do put out a lot of information and so we'll be working with uh, Jeff for his replacement soon to be on uh, bringing all that information that's out there, but trying to collectively bring those sites in at the city location. So if you have a question for Confire and you, you know, here's Confire's website. If you have a question for Eastbay Mud, there's a lot of good information out there already, especially as we're entering fire season. And I know the fire department's going to be getting pretty busy here. Um, so definitely want to just encourage there is a lot of good information out there. Um, so we'll be looking to share that on our city website, the links for the various agencies represented tonight. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. And, and we do. Thank you guys so much. I learned so much. I thank everybody and all your teams, everybody, um, so much for doing as we enter this 
wow, it's just a frightening kind of time right now. And I, I wish you guys, I hope you're all very safe. Um, I know you're out there doing jobs that we can't do and um, please be safe, be careful. Anyways, thank you. Uh, so I will uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.